Hi everyone, if you're joining us, we are going to be starting in about eight minutes. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, that way we're ready once we get rolling. I would love for all of you to join us for the business clinic. The packet that we're going to be going through has been sent to all of you via email, and I will share it in the comments on the Zoom file. And it's also, I believe, already posted in a private group for the Tri Lakes. So, wait just a minute to get everything squared away here, and Martin will be joining us soon, and we'll get rolling. Hi, Coach Rob. All right, at least say something real quick. Can you hear me? We can, in fact. All right, that's excellent. Good job. So it's going to be a little tough for the Zoomers to share the to see the board um, if we write on the board, but obviously you're going to be scrolling through the packet like last time, right? So we'll work that way. So Chris, are you an agent with us? Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. Okay, I guess we haven't had a chance I, to, to I, meet I, yet. I, I was sorry. going to the other day a while back, and I, uh, I uh, ended up getting busy, so. It's okay. Uh, busy with real estate always trumps dealing with me, so yeah. you know, always certain factors. So. Yeah, I've been here since 2017. Okay, great. Do you work on Ann's team? No, but Nikki is actually my aunt. Oh! That's how I'm very that. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. I mainly mean, uh, sell Sorry. Okay. So, so if I get calls for referrals in that area, send them your way. Absolutely. Okay. Yes. Any problem. So. Now, Skylar, you are relatively new, right? Yes, I am. Did you want to miss stuff once yet? I did. Okay. Yeah. How's it going? Good. Yeah? Yeah. Are you enjoying it? Oh, yeah. Okay. I love it. Thanks. Yeah. Obviously, there's, you know, learning curve. And that's sure. Sure. For sure. Hmm. All right. Okay, we'll give it a couple more minutes here. Let everybody, you know, the old rule of real estate is the 12 o'clock meeting starts about 12.05, so we're still 10 minutes early. All right. Martin, have you been doing this for a while? Uh, team leader? I got hired to be the team leader of Killer Rooms like the Ozarks. I started December 2nd officially is when I moved up there. I actually started working for them in November from Texas. Before that, I was with the Killer Rooms Market Center in Texas. I was the product to be coach. Uh, and before that, I owned part of my brokerage with my old broker. Uh, and before that, I was mainly involved in the commercial side of real estate. So I did, uh, we owned warehouses and mini storages. And as we were selling those off, my partners and I, I decided to go into the more retail side of it because I wanted to stay involved in the real estate business. So I also own a commercial wastewater processing company that I'm in the process of selling down in Texas right now. So I've been, I have been in and around the real estate business my whole life. Did uh, oil and gas rights, water sales. Uh, we, we have a bunch of land in Texas. So over the years, I've just pretty much grown up in it. Uh, joined Keller Williams. Be three years March first. So, yeah, three years March first. 
Oh, I think everybody's just trying to space out. The cool kids got here early and took the back seats. So you can sit up front. I don't care. We're, we're six feet. Well, luckily you all got A's. There is no test at the end. So hey, there's pizza in there if you're hungry. Hey, 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 hey. I I was halfway here. Uh -huh. You know, I live. I will be 35 minutes away, and they're like, here's your paperwork. You, can I have? Yeah, like, so I we, we do that for those that are joining on Zoom, because oh, okay. some people are doing virtual. So, you know, we had packets here, but we wanted to also say, all right, you know, if uh, somebody's going on. Are you guys through here? Yes, I do. That's Elise, my assistant. You see her there uh, in the screen. She didn't know who would be here and wouldn't be here in person, because, you know, with the weather and COVID and everything else, it's just come out. So no worries on that. I don't care what's taking. Yes, ma'am. All right. You're not on camera. No, you are not on camera, just them. Just them and I. Just stream Big Brother being yeah. watched. Yeah. What being watched? We are also live streaming on Facebook, so that's a new, we've added that to our repertoire where we can now Zoom, live stream our Zooms to Facebook, so we have virtual platform after virtual platforms. Honestly, drive me crazy. I'm ready to just go back to, everybody show up. Let's just do this in person. I got to do code for authorizing Star yesterday, which was a lot of fun for me because I don't get to train and teach new agents anymore, really. Uh, you know, I spend most of my time working with the, the top 20%, which is great. It's, it's awesome to work with, uh, you know, producing agents, but I miss it. When I was a coach, I spent a lot of time with the new agents. It was a lot of fun yesterday to dive in with these guys. We've got a good group here. Hey, how's he feeling? So far, the reports are he's good. Um, obviously, he was feeling a little crappy Tuesday morning because the Bears suck, but otherwise, um, he's a Bears fan. So Listen, he, was a, he was a little brokenhearted after Monday night, but. Uh, no, he's he's doing good. Um, that there is a contingent of people that were with him that we had to ask to stay home. So obviously, we hate it. And there's nothing I hate worse than calling any of you guys and saying, "Hey, you know, I'm going to need you to avoid the office until you're past your exposure or until a doctor clears you." But we're 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 trying to avoid it running through us like wildfire. So we'll see. How's that? Getting stronger every day. Good. I mean, he's you know still meeting our team meetings and is calling he? us when we do something wrong and lecturing us. So he's right back to the very good. Time. Good. <laughs> Sounds like he's right back in form. Yeah. That's good. That's good. So we're gonna give everybody a couple more minutes. Let you choke down your pizza. Give everybody time to get joined on. We did this Monday. Uh, the lake. Material fits three hours perfectly. We're going to throw a couple of uh, eight to ten minute breaks if we can stay on pace because we know Zoom and class and things. You need to get up and stretch your legs, return a text or a call. So uh, we'll we'll break. And Elise, you keep an eye on that. Yeah. All right. I'm sorry. It's either stay for the whole thing or leave now. I can't really. You can't go into 2021 with half a business plan, Jamie. What the heck? Look, the bad news is the first hour and a half is just me talking about myself. I don't really get into the meat until the second part of the class. So, I'm just well, I already like just ten minutes. Ago. That's okay. My daughter's right. at Filipino. Yeah. Well, I have to drive back to Lake of the Ozarks this afternoon. So my intention will be to get you guys pumped up. Maybe we can slide out and be done a little early if we if we hit our marks. So, just a few minutes. When it comes time for the second break, we'll take a vote. If nobody wants to take it, we'll keep plugging through. There's going to be a lot of information here. Take notes. Stop me if you have, uh, have any questions, but understand this is a, a business plan clinic. It's designed to help you understand what you need to do to make your business plan. Okay, we're not, everybody's not going to leave here with a finished business plan today. One main reason for that is you all have individual situations. And so what we're going to do is we're going to talk in some generic terms. We're going to go through the package so that you can understand the material. Then you can take it back, work on your business plan. And if you want to reach out to me or you want to email it to me or say, hey, can you take a look and work, work me through the process on it, I'm happy to do that as we get towards the end of the year. We'll be circling back and having maybe a follow-up class in December 
you can bring your business plan and we can do some accountability and editing around it. So that is our intention today. All right, what time is it? What do we got here? I'm that guy that's wearing his dead Apple Watch because he forgot to charge it. So if you see me do this and then ask what time it is, it's because I forgot to plug the stupid thing in. Oh, there's a clock up there. All right, excellent. All right, 12.03, Elise, how we doing? We got live, we're good to go. Give me a thumbs up. All right, so we're gonna get started, guys. I am going to go ahead and shut this. People can come in as they want. That way people don't have to listen to me yell. More people better show up or Jennifer's paying me for half that pizza. She said, she keep it going. All right, so thank you for coming and thank you to you guys online. I know we've got Facebook people watching. I know we've got people jumping in on the Zoom. So as they come in, Elise, be sure and watch the chats. And if you guys see Elise waving and trying to get my attention, somebody tell me because I might not be looking and she may have a chat or a question from the group online. So if you pull off the paper clip off your packet, we're going to start with a couple things that I included that aren't necessarily part of the class today, especially the first one. But what it is, is I want you guys, I used this when I was a productivity coach. So to give you background on me, I was just filling Skylar in a little bit. I was a productivity coach for Keller Williams before I became a team leader. I ran a program, had 52 agents. It was almost one third of my market center. We contributed 25% of the company dollar consistently, which anything over about 15%, you're knocking out of the park. That's how I, those numbers are how I kind of got this job, right? That's what led me down this path. One of the biggest things I used in my program was this sheet. We had posters of it. We had blown up posters all around the office in our business centers. And I'm gonna admit something right now, I stole it, okay? I did not come up with this. I did a little R&D, rip off and duplicate. Okay, that's the secret to success. I had a uh, coaching crush, if you will, on a guy named Diego down in Houston who ran a massive program, and he was like my coaching hero. And I took this straight out of his program. What it does is it just kind of lays out what the numbers on your activities you need to undertake to be a capper within a certain amount of time. Now, if you are an agent that's been in the business while and you're producing, you can simply up this to, okay, a cap's about two and a half million right here. Or you guys are 20,000 down here in Branson. So what, 2.2 million gets you to a cap? So you could just say, okay, if I want to get to 4.2 million, you can multiply these numbers, you can just double these numbers. But it's a great understanding of the activities. And the reason this is important is what we're going to talk about today is laying out a plan and a structure where you know your numbers and you know the activities you have to undertake next year to be successful. So this is just a reference piece we won't be touching on here today. The other thing we have here at the top of your packet, if I did a good job putting them in order, I believe I did, is 135. All right, ultimately the 135 is gonna be one portion of your business plan, right? You're gonna have a 135, which is your what, your how and your how, and you're gonna have a 411, which is your what do you have to do every day, every week, every month to get to your achievable goal, okay? I left a blank one here at the front and I included one that's got a, kind of got the template here of what you need to put in there. All right, so when you're doing your one, three, five, after this class, when you're sitting down, you want to fill this out, your one is going to be your big why, and that's where we're going to start here in a second. All right, so your one is your big thing, okay? So, for example, when I set my one, three, five up with my match coach as a team leader, we focused on uh, owner profit. My one thing was to increase the overall productivity of the agent and of the, of the brokerage and help us grow, right? Then the three is going to be the three things that you have to prioritize all year long to achieve that, right? So if mine was owner profit, then obviously driving company dollar and come cutting expenses, those were two of my three because, well, the more money you make and the less money you spend, the bigger your profits, right? So that's the, the three behind it is gonna be the priorities. The five is gonna be five priorities for each strategy, right? So you got a one, a three, and a five. Or I'm sorry, five strategies for each priority. So if my priority is to increase company dollar, then my strategies for that might be, okay, be sure you're training people, be sure you're holding them accountable, be sure you're helping agents generate leads, et cetera, et cetera, okay? So that's the one, three, five at the front. This is what you're gonna use down, down, the, uh, down the stretch. The other thing I threw in here, and they've asked us just to be telling our agents about this a lot, guys, the Compliance Do Not Call Consumer Protection Act. It has, Absolutely nothing to do with this current class, but I'm putting it in everything and trying to remember to remind you guys because we have had agents recently within our organization, not here, but in Keller Williams, getting in trouble legally and getting fines and everything else for not honoring the do not call list. The region has been bugging us to remind our agents 
go to do not call.org. It's pretty simple. Even I figured it out. If I can, anyone can. You can go in there, scrub your database, make sure you understand the laws around that because if you start bugging somebody who's on this list, you're going to end up paying thousands of dollars in fines potentially. And we're going to look at you and say, well, we tried to tell you to go to the do not call registry and check it out. So make yourself aware of this, okay? That's the excess contact. That's just bonus content. Okay? This is the stuff that comes with the box set. So there you go. All right, we're going to dive into our packets. I'm going to start. Page four tells us the table of contents and kind of where we're going. So we're going to breeze right past that. We're going to start with page five. Okay. And first thing you need to ask yourself for you guys at home, as Elise, uh, as Elise travels through the scroll and shows you the packet, grab you a piece of paper, make notes, or if you printed it out, use this. You're going to want to write this down because the information we take today, you're going to go back and reference as you build out your business plan. Okay. So where are you today? And this is going to vary from person to person. Are you, I create and use a business plan as a daily, monthly, annual, long-term guide to run my business. Are you, I've created a business plan and intend to learn and understand and use it more effectively? Are you fairly new to real estate and new to business planning? Or are you on a team and new to business planning? That's okay. We're all at different spots, but just go ahead and make note of where you are. Let's, let's think about, let's start. And any answer is okay, right? So if you're Jerry, you've been in the business a long time, you better not be saying I'm fairly new to real estate and new to business planning, okay? All right, so... The first key to successful business, and I have this conversation a lot with agents, so I'll tell you right now, if you don't know your numbers, I don't want you to feel bad because you're not the only one, but you need to know your numbers, okay? So we're going to start with some simple questions. Number one, the amount of money I need to pay for my lifestyle and get out of debt is what? You don't have to share it if you don't want to, but you need to write it down. Do you know that number? Do you know what $80,000 a year does for you versus one hundred and twenty? Do you know that by the time you include the life you want to live and the debts you have, you got to make 75 just to break even? If you don't know that, well, then we need to sometimes schedule some time with me. We'll do a deeper dive into things like the budget model, right? Because obviously we got to know our numbers, all right? What's your business expenses annually? Now, if you're on a team, that may vary. You may not spend a lot. Your team may spend a lot. So you might say, what's, how much money am I giving to my team? You can maybe put that in there as an expense, right? What's your split equal? Because that's going to be coming out of your money. All right. If you're a newer agent, you're on your own. You may not have a lot of expenses yet, or you may have made the mistake that some of us fall into, which is I went and bought every shiny object that every agent said I needed to have. And everybody told me I needed to worry about. And I've got $400 flowing out of my bank account every month. It's supposed to, you know, just totally revolutionize my real estate business, but I couldn't even tell you how to log in. I lost my password. Right. And we've all, we've all gone through that. I was telling the class Monday, even I'm not immune to it. I went to family reunion last February and I am Mr. Stay away from the vendors. I don't want your shiny object. I got plenty of killer tech I can master. And my old team leader from Texas was there and she's like, Hey, Hey, come here. And, and her and the girl got to working on me. And the next thing you know, I was handing them my credit card, signing up for this stupid thing that's been billing me every month for, until next February. And Oh, it drives me nuts every time, right? So we're not immune, so don't beat yourself up, but you need to know what your expenses are. What's your average commission account, your commission amount, all right? Do you average selling $300,000 homes? Do you average selling $100,000 homes? That's important. Knowing your number there is going to be important because that's how we're going to do some of this business plan. Now, for today's exercises, we're going to assume a $200,000 selling price because that's easy math, $6,000 gross commission at 3%, right? So we're just going to do that. But it may vary for you, right? I know, I know uh, we have agents that sell a lot of lots. Their commission may be smaller. We have agents that sell only luxury. Their gross commission may be higher. So know your numbers there. All right. Number of listing appointments you went on last year. What is that? Ballpark it if you don't know exactly. Uh, did you go on 40? Did you go on one a week and that's 50, right? Did you go on one a month and that's 12? So just think about that. Write that number down. Number of buyer appointments gone on last year, okay? Number of listings sold or number of buyers closed, numbers of names in your database, and who on who is your team besides you? Finish out those questions real quick. This is information that's gonna be important as we move forward, okay? All right. 
right, Elise? Everybody's writing their numbers down. We can probably scroll up to the next page here. All right, so where am I going? All right, the, the goals of this course are, oh, can we get a, can we get a mute there? Or was somebody talking to us? Or did, was I the only one that heard the voice? I could be losing my mind. Oh, okay, all right, it happens. All right, so our goals of this course, understand the power of the five fundamental business models of the MREA and recognize that the five models are interconnected for the important role of planning, checking on, and projecting your business. Now guys, these are the five models, here's the deal. We're gonna spend a lot more time talking about economic lead gen and budget today, those three models. The org model and the expansion model, if your business is ready for that conversation, get with me, we'll do an appointment, we'll, we'll bust it out. But if you don't have a team, you don't need to worry about the org model right now. You are chief cook and bottle washer. If you don't have a team that has a bunch of people on it, you're probably not ready to talk about the expansion model, okay? So we're not gonna focus a lot on those, but if you wanna get together and dive in deeper, you know, someone like Jerry who's, who's got a team, happy to have that conversation with you, okay? We're gonna create a custom plan for your business, whether you're new to real estate or seasoned professional. So we're gonna show you how to use these worksheets that'll get you started on working on your business plan. And we're gonna initiate a plan of execution through accountability with a peer partner, productivity coach, team leader, team lead if on a team, so that's Rainmaker, MCA, et cetera. So guys, part of the execution of this is gonna be you take what you learned today, take these sheets, go knock out that business plan. Like I said, I'm happy to hold you accountable if you wanna send it to me. If you're on a team or came with a partner or came with somebody, hold each other accountable. The key is, don't go into 2021 without a plan, all right? We're gonna talk about that more in a minute. So, all right, so let's start off with three learning goals, all right? Three things I wanna understand by the end of this training, okay? So somebody tell me, why are you here and what are you hoping to understand by the end of this training? Hi, everybody. We're getting more people on here. Anybody? Anybody? Yeah, How many people are here because they thought they had to be here? Okay. okay, that's all right. All right, honesty, that's good. That's good. You should be here, right? You're new, so you're hoping to learn anything you can, right? All right, so three things I want to understand by the end of this training. You want to just grow your knowledge of how to even put a business plan together. Would that be fair? Okay, someone else. Oh, uh, I got something in the chat here. Oh yeah, okay. That's not a that's not an answer. That's a statement. Okay. All right. So we'll move forward. Some people are Googling the answer real quick, right? What am I here for? <laughs> Everybody ask Google, see what it tells you. All right, so your three learning goals, they need to be to understand how to put your numbers into a plan. We're gonna hope to understand what what our goals need to be. We're gonna talk about smart goals, okay? And number Number three, your goal by the, to understand by the end of this training needs to be what do you need to undertake next year to have a more successful year than you had this year? Guys, I'm going to tell you right now, don't buy the hype. There's going to be tons of real estate to do next year. All right? It's a, it's a simple macroeconomic conversation. Supply and demand. We have a limited supply. We have exorbitant demand. Even if half the buyers were all killed tomorrow by the coronavirus, there would still be three buyers for every list. There's going to be plenty of demand that will keep the market healthy, but we're going to have to have a plan. We're going to have to be purposeful. We're going to have to dig in and know what our game is, know where we got to focus our attention so that you can go out there and capture your share of that business. All right. So how will you make it happen? All right. This is where you're making a commitment to yourself, not me. Right? So you need to look at these three things and ask yourself, what are you going to do? Are you going to make a business plan? Right? Are you level one? If you have level one commitment, that's okay. At least you made a plan. Is level two, you're going to complete a business plan and commit to following it, right? Which, I mean, I know it sounds like duh, but believe me, guys, there's going to be plenty of people that do this exercise and leave it in the drawer for the entire year and never look at it, all right? Oh, we have an honest person in the front. She is she is raising her hand saying that is her. My right. third year. I'm going to make it happen this year. Gotcha. <laughs> If you think you're going to do that, maybe you should uh, set it as your screensaver, as a PDF, as your screensaver, or uh, leave yourself a little time capsule note with it, like, hey, girl, can't believe you didn't pull this out for 12 months and see if that really is how it goes, right? <laughs> All right, or in level three, you're going to complete a business plan, you're going to share it with your coach or your peer partner who's committed to your growth and execute your plan by checking your activities and results against it 
weekly, monthly, and annually, right? Now, obviously, what we'd like is level three. In, in absence of perfection, I always encourage people, accept production. If you make the plan, if you endeavor to follow it and you don't check it one week, get back on the horse and check it the next week. But if you make a plan and you follow it and you actually touch base with it, it's going to make your life easier in 2021. All right. So, page seven, right? Think powered by a big why. All right. We all got up and came here today for some reason. For most of us, it's probably money, right? Or it's pizza. That's fair, right? We all have a big why. It's the reason we get out of bed and go to work. Okay, I can share mine with you. You can think about what yours is. Mine is, is pretty simple. Mine's a selfish one. So I was a single dad for years, right? Raised my kiddo, got her up, saved for her college, managed to do all that, but saving for her college left zero behind for the old man to retire on. Okay, so now she's off to college, and I've got that covered. So my entire big why is, is working hard so that I can save. I mean, I'm still a young guy. I'm just barely 40, but I don't want to work. I don't want to do this time 65. I want to go play golf. You know, I want to go hang out. I can't do that until I reach X level of retirement savings. So my big why, why I do this, why I work so hard, is to plan for my future. Now, some of you younger folks, maybe you got a baby, right? So maybe your big why is that kid. Maybe it's diapers. Maybe it is just pizza. That's okay, right? It's whatever. It's whatever your big why is. That's what you need to put on there, right? You're big. It's big because you're after extraordinary results. The why is the reason you get ever, up every day, right? My big why is not just to barely make it. I'm not going to try to live along in my social security. I want to, I want to ball out in my fifties. I do not want to be working. So if I'm still here when I'm 50, please someone come remind me of this class and smack me and say, what the hell? How'd you go wrong? Okay. All right. <clears throat> so your big why is your purpose. It's your mission. Whoa. Easy there, killer. Give me a little scroll down. It's your purpose. It's your mission and need. It fuels you with focus and energy and it powers your action. So everybody take a moment. If you haven't yet, Write down your big why. You're going to need to know this. It's going to be important. If you can't answer this question, schedule some time with me. Let's dig in. All right? If you don't feel like you have a big why, well, maybe I can coach you up. Maybe you do. You just don't know it. All right? I taught this a version of this class, not this class, but I taught this when I was a coach in Texas, and a lady actually stood up. And we were having a good class, and we got to the big why section, and she stood up. And she said, I want to leave my husband. <laughs> <laughs> and the room froze. I mean, I'm standing there and I'm like, well, I'd like to help you do that. I guess. I, I, okay, that's awesome. Whatever you there's no wrong answer here, right? I mean, she, she was being honest about it. She couldn't afford to live the life she wanted to until she got her business up to a certain level. Hey, what are you going to do, right? So you get some entertaining answers. So whatever you put on there, don't sweat it. Your answer is the right answer for you, okay? All right, so big goals and big models, right? How do we get to our big why? Well, we're going to need some big goals and big models. Lise, can I get a scroll up there? Thank you. So when you're setting goals, you need to have your, your someday goals. You need to have a five-year. You need to have a one-year. You want to have a monthly, a weekly, a daily, and right now. And it's okay if your goal right now is to get through this class as fast as possible. That's okay. No judgment here, right? If your goal right now is you're going to learn so good, how to do a business plan that you never have to come to a class like this again. That's okay too. It's, it's all right. The point is you got to have those goals. Okay. So take a minute and think about what your goals are in relation to this sheet and write them down. What's your right now goal? Where do you want to be in a week? How about a month? What about a year? You know, do you have something you want to pay off? Do you have something you want to buy? Do you have somebody you want to marry? Do you want to expand your family, grow your business, et cetera, et cetera. You two grinning at each other back there. I saw that. Are we are we getting married this year? Is that the goal? No. Okay. <laughs> okay. So we're gonna put that on y'all someday goal. I want to leave my girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> Well, listen, I can, I can tell you how to hack off somebody, but that's a separate coaching conversation. So that's if you're going for that, call me. We'll yeah, right. We'll do lunch. All right. So you should know these answers. If you don't know these answers, don't feel guilty, but you need to spend some time. This is a great time of year for a goal setting retreat. Weather's nasty. Business is slowed down a touch. Take a day off. Take a day off. 
Go to your favorite coffee shop. Get away from your family. Get away from your house. Spend time thinking about these. The, the, the more introspection you give and the more consideration you give to these, the, the better it will kind of become because they'll really be goals that mean something to you. And the more they mean to you, the more seriously you'll take it, the more you'll follow your plan and, and want to accomplish it, right? All right. So on page nine, it talks about the models real shortly. All right. And we're going to dive into some of them a little bit more deeply, but we have the MREA models. Now, you'll hear me swear by the MREA. If you sit down to coach with me, you're going to hear things like, well, the MREA says, because I believe in it a lot. If you don't have a copy, please stop me after class. I have copies. I'm happy to give you one. I would love for you to read it. If you don't like to read, but you drive a lot, Audible. I use the Audible version of the Red Book all the time because I can listen to it while I'm driving, right? And, and you get a lot of, of information. So, the K is the KW Bible. And, and the beauty is I give it to recruits, even if they aren't going to join us. I say, listen, here's the deal. It's not a book about how to be a great Keller Williams agent. It's a book about how to run any business the right way. It's a book about how to be great at the real estate business, no matter where you are, who you are. All right. And, and sometimes it takes you a reading or two to really grasp some of the concepts. But the truth is, every time I go back to it, and I've probably cleared it six or seven times now since I joined Keller Williams, and every time there's a new aha, there's a new something little in it that will pick it up. So dive into those, right? So the economic model is a formula that describes the relationship between a series of activities and the specific outcomes they produce. It shows you where your money comes from, where it goes, and how much is left over for you, right? So in the economic model, it's all about, hey, where's the money coming from? Where am I spending it? How does it go, okay? The lead generation model, a plan for where your money comes from, from your lead generation activities. It's a companion to the economic model since leads are the fuel to the economic engine of your business, okay? Obviously, lead generation is the key, right? We all know what the five money-making activities are for a real estate agent. If you don't, grab a pen. We're gonna line them out right now. Number one is lead generation. Pretty duh, right? I hope that wasn't a huge aha for anybody, right? If it was, if it was, talk to me about whoever trains you. We'll get them straightened out because lead generation has to be number one. Number two is lead follow-up. If you're not lead generating, you need to be following up on those leads, right? Number three is appointments. You need to be going on listing and buying appointments. If you're not out there going on appointments, you're not getting agreements, which aren't funneling down into contracts, which aren't funneling down into closings, which is not funneling down into money. Okay, it's all about that MREA funnel, right? Number four is negotiating contracts. You need to be writing offers. You need to be accepting offers. You need to be negotiating those contracts. Number five is scripts and role play. All right. If any of your activities aren't those five things, and if anybody needs me to repeat one or slow down, please tell me you guys online. I know I'm all over the place here. Um, but those are the five money-making activities. Everything else that is in your world, that is in your business, those are things that as we have conversations around leverage, that's what we're talking about, right? You need to leverage that off. All right, so if I'm, if I'm Jerry, Jerry's a rainmaker. She's been in the business. She's building a team. The reason we coach Jerry to build her team a certain way is I want Jerry focused on those five activities. So when paperwork, when, you know, we all get paperwork mountain, right? We reach that point where we got 18 files on our desk and eight of them are closed and Monica's, hey, are uh, you ever going to come and get these checks or put in commission requests? Uh, we got all this stuff backing up. Okay, I need Jerry to leverage that stuff off so she can go get four more listings. Right, we want to keep her on the money making activities. So that's why that's why we talk about those in terms of leverage, right? So the budget model is a plan for where your money goes between the time you receive it and you keep it for yourself. The focus is on max, uh, minimizing your expenses to maximize your profit, right? Spend X amount of money in specific areas to support those those uh, efforts. What that basically boils down to is: Are you holding your money accountable? All right. Now I'm willing to bet, and we won't do this because I don't want to actually see your bank accounts, but I bet if we all pulled out our bank app and we all went back over the last month or two, there'd be some little $5.99 charge for some subscription that we have no, okay, no pointing fingers. Hey, no point, yeah. All right, no, the, the point is we all have them, right? I just shared with you my stupid subscription I bought at Family Unis. We all have that thing that's charging us. Well, you know what the truth is? If you don't know where that subscription's going, you can't log in it. You're not using that thing for you. Then you're not doing a good job of holding your money accountable. The, the budget model is all about, do I hold my money accountable? If I give Jerry a dollar 
to do X amount of work and Jerry doesn't do that work, well, I'm not going to pay her again. But yet we will pay these inanimate objects or these subscriptions for months and months and months. We won't hold them accountable, right? I mean, if I didn't show up here today and teach this class, Carolyn would fire me. I mean, maybe not today, but, but you know, if I had a pattern of not showing up, she might give me grace if I you know, just got sick or something. But the point is, she holds her money accountable. She spends her money on me to help run her organizations. I have to do that. She holds that accountable or she fires me. You have to do that with your money. And so oftentimes the reason, guys, and then, you know, we won't go down this rabbit hole too far, but there's psychology that they're using on these things. There's a reason they structure them the way they do is because they know I will be bothered by $100 a month, but not by $299. And yet over a course of time, they'll get that $299 and it'll equal hundreds and thousands of dollars because I just keep paying it for my entire life because I never think to, to change it, right? Same thing with like your Netflix account. If you're not watching Netflix the last six months, why don't you cut it off? Well, I don't know. I might want to watch something. Okay. Well, you can always resubscribe, but we don't want to do that, right? So you got to hold your money accountable. Now, like I said, organizational model, that's about uh, a plan for hiring and help and talent to grow your business. An expansion model, a plan to apply your systemized business model to additional locations. We're not going to dive into those today, okay? If you want to have that conversation, I'm happy to have it with you. It's not really germane to what we're trying to accomplish today. All right. There you go. Okay, so we turn over to page 10. We get our first look at the economic model, okay? So when we're looking at this page, what we can see is they did it for a million dollar net income. Now, if that number causes the monkey in your head to say, well, I'm not ever gonna make a million dollars, so that's fine. That's fine, you, you might not, it might not be your desire, it might, but the reality is you can just pull a couple zeros out of any of this, it's just math, right? So you can change that number to 100,000 and 75,000 and 75,000 250 works the same concept, okay? And we're gonna, we're gonna dig into this, we have some blanks that as we go, we're gonna actually show you how to work through with your numbers on this to get where you need to achieve, all right, for your plan. So the benefits of the economic model, it provides the number of appointments and units sold to meet your goal. Guys, when you're setting goals, don't set volume goals. Volume is a gift of the market. Home prices go up, home prices go down. That is the nature of our market. Now lately, for the last 10 years, yeah, it's been on a, on a pretty steady climb, right? But if you've been in the business long enough, you understand that the real estate pricing goes and then dips, and then goes, and then dips. I mean, it's stair steps up. It's always eventually going up, but it's it can be kind of sticky, right? And there are going to be pockets, even in a market like this, where prices are going to go down. Uh, we have a house that we were trying to sell in Fort Worth, paid three forty five dollars for it. However, in that development, in the rare spot where they're still building lots of homes, the good builders left and brought in cheaper builders who started building new houses at two ninety nine. dollars so all of a sudden, in an environment where everybody's like, oh, real estate's on fire, everything's going up, home prices in that neighborhood are actually going down, right? So there's good, so don't focus on volume. Focus on units sold, all right, and focus on appointments, all right? If you know that you've got a 50% conversion rate on appointments, that, that every listing appointment, every two listing appointments you go on, you get one listing, well, then if your goal is 20 listings, you know you need Anybody? How many more? Ratio, how many take? Right. So, so if we know you're a 50 percenter and you need 20 listings, how many appointments do you need? 40. 40. That's right. It's it's honestly that simple, right? It's all about understanding your numbers, and, and that will lead you to an understanding of what activities you have to undertake to hit those numbers. Okay. So it reveals your conversion rate and identifies areas of improvement. So when you're looking through your numbers, there may be somebody that's had a busy year. Right, maybe one of you guys has had a crazy busy year and you're like, wow, man, I've never done 35 units before. That's insane, all right? But do you know how many appointments it took? Now, do you know that your conversion rate was 75%, 80%, was it 50%, was it 20? You know, did you go on 100 listing appointments and only get 20 listings, right? What, what was your conversion rate? Understanding that, once again, will help you understand the activities you need to undertake. It, the economic model allows for mastery over your business. If you don't know your numbers, you don't have your business mastery, right? If you can't tell me what your average gross commission is, 
you need to know that number, right? And it's okay, don't feel guilty. It's an easy number to, to learn. Just go look at your production, look at your closed transactions, add them all up, divide them by that amount. Feel free to use a calculator or your fingers and toes, depending on how you do it, right? And know that number. All right, keep the focus on a profit first perspective. You'll hear us say things a lot in other ways like lead with revenue, okay? What we mean is you gotta be profit focused. You gotta, you gotta look at everything from the lens of how do I turn a profit? How does this fit my business model? If it's not profitable, it's not worth your time or your money. All right, there are no, there's no reason to be charitable in this business. You can give to charities, you can, you can help a fellow agent out, but when you're doing your activities and you're looking at your money, everything that you do needs to pass through that lens of profitability, okay? A great example is my stupid thing I signed up for Family Union has yielded me no profits. So I should not have done that. It has been a net loser, right? I didn't sit there and think, how will I turn a profit out of this? I sat there and got my arm twisted by my old TL. And she said, come on, do this with me. And I said, okay, gosh. And now I wish I hadn't. So don't, don't allow that. Instead, run everything through the profit first lens, all right? Lead with revenue. It helps you keep your budget model in line. It provides benchmarks to hold your team accountable to and allows you to gain insight into your economic decisions before you make them. If I know, a great example is yesterday I had a conversation with an agent who is at the point where they need to hire an admin. Now they didn't want to hire an admin because agents never want to hire an admin as the first step in growing their team. They always want to get a buyer's agent and they want to get a buyer's agent because, man, I'm so busy with these buyers and nobody really likes working with buyers and ooh, I can make money off of that person. And I understand all that, but there's a reason the model's set up the way it is, right? Once again, what that person needed was they have paperwork mountain. So, so what we saw when we looked at their numbers is they'll have five transactions, and then, boy, getting all those closed takes them all their time. They're doing their own admin work. When they come out of getting those closed, maybe they got one listing. And then they got to build the pipeline back up. And it creates this fluctuation in their year. That's not what you want. You want a nice state of business. We want to be boring. We want a nice steady line all year long. Predictable. So the first step is hiring an admin. When I have that conversation with agents, can anybody tell me what their first objection always is? Money. I don't want to hire someone. I don't want to, I don't want to commit to that. I don't want to bring Jamie on and have to pay her for the next year. Well, nobody told you to do that, right? We, we talk about holding her money accountable. And what we did was we knew her numbers. So we looked at it and said, okay, you average about $6,000 in gross commission. You have reached capacity at about 25 transactions a year. If you added this person for 30, 60, 90 days at $2,000 per month, just ballparking what you pay them, right? We're just using easy math. And that's only $6,000. That's only one of her average transactions. So try to see. I said, so after 90 days, if instead of going one, five, one, five, you spent 90 days going five, 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 well, then that's a good investment because you're focused on the money making activities. She's worrying about paper mountain, right, right, transaction mountain and all the documents she has to take care of. And if it increases her business from 25 to 50, right, if she's able to close 50 units because someone else is hauling that water, well, then even if she paid that person 40, 50, 60,000 a year, she still made another $100,000 for her business, right? So we have hey, to look I at it. Know, I want to know where you're getting an admin that's being paid 40 to $50,000 a year, okay? I'm sorry, you there's some interference. I can't hear you. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's a, I should probably not have those conversations when she's on here. That's a good point, Elise. Okay. <laughs> You're getting a Christmas bonus. Eggnog. Um, all right. So, so, um, but the reality is it's a good decision for her, but she didn't look at it because like you said, money is the first worry. Okay. So you have to understand your numbers so that you can understand what would this expenditure help me gain, right? You can't just say, oh, man, I don't want to pay somebody 30,000. Well, what if paying somebody 30,000 made you another eight? I, I'm not a financial whiz, but I'll trade you 30,000 for 80,000 all day long. I'll give you 30, you give me 80, I'll make that deal all day long, right? So it, sometimes it's important to know our numbers so that we can understand and empower our decision-making down the road. If we looked at it and said, well, I mean, you close 15 deals, you're not necessarily putting much into it. Your average gross commission is only 4,500. So if you added this person and it doubled it, you might make an extra $10,000. Well, then that might 
that also might inform that decision that it's not the right time for them. And instead, they need to focus on their other models and get their business in line before they leverage out, right? All right, so that's the economic model. And we'll dive more into it on a second. The lead generation activities. Guys, this is just a, a drop in the bucket, right? If you've been around for a while, you know there is a million different lead generation activities you can undertake, all right? But it's a good start, okay? Phone, face-to-face, -face, the prospecting, the both, the farming, um, events. Now, obviously, maybe we're not having a lot of events in person right now, but have you cooked up a way? You know, I heard a great idea at Family Reunion. An agent was telling us about they created a private Facebook group for all of their uh, clients. Anyone that bought or sold with them got added to this Facebook group. Then they went around to their vendor partners and said, hey, I'll let you in this group if you'll offer people in my group little swag or discounts or whatever for being a part of this group. And then they do fun things just for that closed group and it allows them high level touches with their people. It allows them to leverage their vendor relationships. So in times like these, you have to get creative if you can't do in-person stuff all the time. Like I know a lot of agents did pie giveaways at the holidays. Don't know if anybody here does it. Um, I would assume there's somebody that does it. That's a pretty standard thing. I'm not sure you're going to do that this year, right? I'm not sure a bunch of people running through picking up food is a, is a safe thing. Now, I'm not telling you how to run your business. I will tell you though, remember you are a business. If somebody gets sick and they can trace it back to your activity, you may wish you hadn't given out pies and had instead emailed out pie gift certificates, right? Um, but the point is, you've got to get creative because times like these are tough and there is, there's a million different ways. I want to encourage you guys to think differently in 2021. All right. If you don't watch CNBC, that's okay, but I would suggest you start. All right. Don't watch Fox News or CNN or MSNBC. Don't watch any of that purely because they're only going to give you their version of everything. Watch CNBC. Money people don't care. They stay out of the politics. The business channel they're just going to tell you where the money is. They're just going to tell you where the market's going. They're going to report on housing data every day. All right. I'm a devout CNBC follower. If you, you want to get your politics, okay, go great. But I don't want to wake up and talk politics. I want to wake up and talk money. I want to wake up and talk real estate business. So that's why I tune into there. And if you listen, you'll hear all of these very wealthy people who are experts come in and tell you where the world is going. Okay. Right now, you'll hear a lot of people whose grand total financial education is pretty much zero, they'll tell you things like, oh, it's just like 2008, there's gonna be a ton of foreclosures. No, there's not. There's gonna be more foreclosures than there's been in the last couple of years, because there hadn't been any hardly in the last couple of years, but this is nowhere like 2008. Real estate was at the heart of that collapse. The real estate market has nothing to do with current financial struggles. It, it's, it's not, uh, we're not involved in curing the pandemic. We're not involved in social un unrest. None of the current economic situations are truly coming from the real estate market. And unlike 2008, in the last 10 years, if you bought a house, it is almost 100% guarantee it's worth more than you paid for. Now, if you bought it last week, we may have trouble selling it for a profit. But in the last 10 years, man, the market's done this. And there's been a few years where it's done this, okay? And unlike 2008, they're not giving stupid loans out. All right? People were not able to just call up now and swear to a bank, hey, don't worry about it. I'll make a half million a year. Yeah, I'll write that down on a piece of paper. Loan me all this money. That's what they were doing that led up to the crisis then. I don't know if you bought a house recently, but trust me, they are crawling all over your financials. So the truth is homeowners have probably never been in a better position in this country from an equity standpoint, from a low interest rate, low loan. God, you can refinance for interest rates in the twos. You put, so there's zero evidence to tell us that a wave of foreclosures is coming to the, to the mass market. Now, when you're thinking about lead generation in 2021, you're building your plan, I want to encourage you to dig a little deeper though. All right, where will there be foreclosures? Investment properties. There'll be some there because there's going to be plenty of people that over the last few years said, oh, I'll buy a rent house. Man, that's right. Really, I'm going to own a rent house. But they weren't really capable. All right, they didn't really have a plan. They just had money, all right? You all know it. If you worked with a client, they think if they bought a house ever in their life, they're a real estate expert, right? I mean, I, I had a client one time, I'm sure Jerry's been through this, I'm sure, I'm sure you have. Anybody that's been in the business a while, I had a client one time, 
that had been an agent in Arizona 25 years ago. And here we are selling his house in Texas. Now this guy, I, I'll skip to the end where my broker had to drag me down the sidewalk and throw me in his car because we were in, in the guy's yard um, losing our minds because it was no longer his yard. He had sold his house. I represented the buyers, right? He, he had sold his house to my best friend and his wife and their three kids who decided to take a week vacation because we gave him a seven day lease back. When they came back in town, the dude had not moved out of the house because the moving company sent a truck that's for office furniture and not household furniture. I mean, this guy was a piece of work. And whenever anything came up, he would default to, well, you know, I was a real estate agent and I'd finally had that answer one too many times and ended up, you know, getting, getting in trouble from my broker because I should have just walked away, but I just couldn't let it go. Get out of my house. My best friend and his family are living with his parents with their three kids. I mean, you know, we got to get you out of here. So you're going to have people like that that think they were experts, but they weren't. So they bought an investment property and they never factored for four months not getting paid. They probably never even did the math thinking about what happens if somebody doesn't pay rent one month, right? So those people are going to be struggling. Let me tell you something else that's going to be big. <laughs> if you've never evicted somebody, anybody in here ever evicted somebody or had to evict somebody? It is the worst thing in the world. I managed some apartment complexes that a friend of mine's family owned for a while, and I had to evict some of those people. Let me give you a couple of, of tidbits. The guy's never there. The husband is never there. He manages to be gone when you show up with the sheriff deputy and the wife and the children are there. And they are watching as you drag their crap and throw it out on the curb. And it will seriously make you question what you do. Even though you're in the right, even though you followed all the things, you gave them all the chance you went to court, it still will rip your heart out. There's going to be people that go through that once and want to sell that house, right? They're going to go, whoa, I never want to deal with that. There's a lot of people that went out and financed a bunch of Airbnbs. Because, oh, Airbnb, that's so awesome. But now they're struggling. So you got to dig deeper. There's not going to be mass neighborhood foreclosures, but there are going to be pockets where people are going to want to sell their house. Your listing inventory in 2021 is going to come from these places. All right? It's going to come from these places, and it's going to come from big city buyers who want to move to a more rural area. And you're going to get a chance to refer a lot of listings if you have a good referral relationship in a big city. If you don't, I encourage you to get one because you guys are going to want to work together. All right. So that's where things in the inventory. So when you're looking through this lead gen activities page, think outside the box. Understand the year we're going into next year. All right. If you're working with buyers right now and you can't find them anything, have you searched the rent houses? Go online and Google for rent in Branson. If you find a for rent house that matches your buyer's needs, call that person. They may want to sell. And, 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 and it's not a solicitory. It's not a cold call. It's, it's very simple. You know, ring, ring. Jamie answers the phone. Hello. I say, hey, is this Jamie? Yeah. Hey, this is Martin with Keller Williams. Listen, I'm sorry to bother you. I saw you had a house for rent. I've got some buyers that are desperate. Any chance you'd consider selling that? They may say no. They may say yes. They may say, well, can you, I mean, maybe, I don't know. They won't get mad at you. Right, and there's a good chance that at least 50% of the people trying to rent a house would not hate ringing the register. There's a good chance they bought it five or 10 years ago and it's worth a considerable amount more than they paid for it. This would be a nice time to cash out some on the sidelines. Do you have clients that you sold an investment property to? Have you called them and said, hey, how's all this hitting you? Are, are you kind of freaked out? Do we need to run the numbers and make sure this is still a good investment? Do you know what a good investment is? Does everybody understand the 1% rule when you're, when you're pricing investment properties? If not, it's pretty simple. As a rule of thumb, if you can rent it for 1% of what you have in it, it's a pretty solid investment. Even more so here in Missouri because you guys have pretty low property taxes, right? I mean, I was shocked when I got up here and saw the property taxes. I come from a state with no state income tax, but with booger, I mean, massive booger property taxes, right? So here, that 1% rule would even serve you better. So if you haven't thought of those things, think of those things, you're going to have to think outside the box. Do not listen to anyone who tells you some sort of 2008-like collapse is coming. There's zero evidence that says our industry is fixed to fall off a cliff. All right? We'd have to build a million more houses to get the inventory right back. We'd have to have buyer demand fall off a cliff. The Fed is throwing money. Interest rates are at all-time lows. There's going to be plenty of buyers, okay? And 
important statistic, and we talked about this in a sales meeting a few weeks ago, the home buyer demographic. So 75% of the home buyers in this country are the 35 and up crowd. Currently, their unemployment rate's only like five something, right? People that can actually afford to buy homes still have jobs, okay? So all this talk of unemployment, hey, and I'm not trying to take shots at if you're a waiter or a waitress or a young college student, I'm not saying you're not struggling, but this isn't a social conversation. This is a business conversation. The business fact is the majority of our potential clients have zero economic issues. And, and to be honest with you, most of them are starting to think about buying and selling because, hey, if I'm going to be working from home, I want to be over there where the internet's better. Or, hey, you know what? I don't have to worry about my commute anymore. You know, we have several people that are part of the Lake of the Ozarks investor group that were from St. Louis, they all moved down to their houses at the lake and sold their houses in St. Louis. Because if they're gonna be working on Zoom, they're gonna be working on Zoom at the lake. We got a pretty nice lake here in Branson, right? We got some pretty views here. So those are things that are gonna come. So be cognizant of that when you're doing your lead generation activities. All right, budget benchmarks. So this is an example page when we talk about the budget model. It talks about how you should break it down, right? And it shows you best practices if you're at the million dollar gross commission income or two and a half million dollars, but it also tells you here's the 150, right? So your company dollar split, that could be a uh, it's cost of sales for your individual agents is your split. So obviously adjust that up to 23 here. Uh, this was written for a different market center that had a, a different cap. Um, gross profit, that's what you should be, then your expenses, then your net income. If you are a team, you want to strive for a 40, 30, 30 split. All right, what that means is for every $100 you take in, $40 should be net profit, $30 should be expenses, $30 should be cost of sales. And honestly, Monday in the conversation, we had a lot of our bigger teams in the class and the conversation that we kind of, you know, sometimes you chase rabbits for a minute in these classes. One of the things we got off on was truly, this is a bit of a dated model in, in this respect because technology has allowed for so much um, improvement in, in your spend that, that if you're a team, you probably should be able to get your cost of sales down to 15 or 20%. 30% is really too high. If you're still at 30%, you need to dig in on what you're doing and see if there's not some technology alternatives to help you accomplish that same goal, but at a lower cost, right? So, and then 30% expenses, you know, that's gonna be salaries, office rent, uh, you know, shiny bells and whistles, whatever you wanna call it there. So take a look at this, understand your budget, and. We'll have, we will have um, through the rest of the year, sales meetings will all be about the models. So we're going to have one in November because election day falls on one Tuesday and then Thanksgiving falls on another. So we're going to have one in November and then we'll have another couple in, in December and we'll cover the models in more depth that will out. Also, we have an MREA chart of accounts. All right. If you're not good at accounting, if you think, oh, numbers make my head hurt, math, don't talk to me about accounting. I, you need to learn. You're in business. None of you have a job. You all own a business. Business owners that succeed can at least do very basic fundamental accounting. And, and you can go in the MREA or you can use this. We have paperwork here. The chart of accounts is simple and all you got to do is manage to write the numbers down in it. Just keep track of them, okay? So that's the chart of accounts. The hiring path of the MREA like I said, we're going to skip the work. Can we take a like, break real quick? I'm sorry? Can we take a break real quick? Uh, yeah. Can I finish this one thought and then we take a break? Yeah. Okay. All right. So we're not going to dive in real hard on this, but if you're considering how should I grow my business, if you're a new agent and someday you want to be a big bad agent, here's the model. This is how you're going to grow your business, okay? And I'm happy to have these conversations with you as you get those steps. All right. Elise says it's time for a break, and she is the taskmaster. So it is, um, what time does that say? It's 12.52. So we're going to give everybody 10 minutes. We'll come back, and we'll start at 102. So you can use the restroom, get a drink, grab some more pizza, stretch your legs. And thank you all. We'll be right back. Uh, 
Oh. Yes, ma'am. Is there um is there like a report that can be done that shows how far away I can find? Yeah, you should be able to go to your MyKW reports. But now it'll lag because they update on transmittal. So it might not have anything that closed like this month. It might be, you know, months back. Um, but if you go to your MyKW, there's a ton of uh, page report options. And one of them, I can't remember the name of it as well. You can also hit Monica too and see where you're at. I think so. I have a list that I know I have a resource here. I just don't know how to do Well, you know, we used to have the little speedometer thing on our dashboard that would just show us. So. That's what I was looking for on the van, like on the van. How do I find this? Uh, if you go to reports, you might go find it, but the command system is still lagging with the transmittal on the mono basis. So I would say I would say best practice is my KW for reports. Yeah, for sure. All right. Excuse me. I'm trying to call real quick. I know there was a way to do this because I've done it before. You can export all of them and claim all 4,000 whatever or whatever. No, I don't want to do that. I want only these. I know, and that's what it was telling me. I Googled that part of that. that was but if way. I go to the next 50, it's going to make another list of another list. I don't want to do that. Can you then copy and paste them into the same CSV? And then upload that CSV into Mojo? It's possible, but. But my computer is going to be at home. I could not get either one of those to do it. It's on the bed either. I don't know. I usually do it. 
All right, all right, all right. So 60 seconds till break's officially over. We'll see if Miss Elise jumps back in here. Did you get my text message just now? Uh, the one about the scam? Yeah. Yeah, I saw that, thank okay. you. Guys, if you don't know, um, it hit our market center late today, but it's hit both these market centers periodically. If you get a text that says it's from the broker or from some other agent or and hey, could you please go give me some gift cards and wire them to me? I'm in a meeting. That is a scam. Somehow scammers figured out how to get all our information off the board list. So don't do that. We had somebody actually go buy the gift cards. We managed to stop them before they sent the gift cards to the person. Uh, it was for Deb. I can't remember what the agent was, but it did happen here as well. So Mike, they hit our morning center this morning. Ma'am? Mike Staten commented on that Facebook post and said he sent her $50. Oh. Mike Staten, good Lord. Well, I love Mike. Um, and I'm not going to say that he's who I try to trick, but, you know, <laughs> bless his heart. We'll, we'll have to help him out. <laughs> All right, so we're diving back in. We're getting started. Everybody got a chance to stretch their legs. If we go to page 17, we have the 411. This is where it starts to get good, okay, guys? So we talked a little about the models, talked about what we're trying to achieve. Now, 
what we're talking about is the 411. If you notice, page 18 is a blank one. Page 17 is a uh, pre-filled out example, okay? So let me share with you, when I first joined Keller Williams and they uh, said, you gotta make a 411, I struggled because I was trying to figure out this one thing, as if I had to do the one thing. Well, you don't. You can see here that you can have some annual goals for your business. They can be more than one. You can have net income. You can have units sold, listing appointments, events, contacts in your database, uh, update your budget, attend all these different classes, all right? When you're building your 411 out, what are your annual goals for the year is what goes in this first section, okay? That is the thing that we're going to try to achieve for the year. And the concept of the 411 is we have our one big set of goals for the year, and we have our things we're going to do every month that will help us accomplish that goal. And then we have our things we're going to do every week that help us accomplish the monthly goal that helps us accomplish the yearly goal. Does that make sense? Okay. Questions around that? No. All right. So you can see here, annual goals, net income, total units sold. If you want to fill those out, if you want to use this as your template, go ahead or you can use the blank one, right? Monthly goals. So we're going to break it down. If I have a goal of 12 listing appointments as my annual goal, what is my monthly goal for listing appointments going to be? One, that's right. Don't dead. Good job. All right. That's, I'm trying to keep it simple, right? But there you go. There's no trick questions. It's one. All right. Now, more than likely, your goal is going to be 20 or 30 units, at least if you're an individual agent. If you're a team, depending on what your business was last year, your goal may be 100. All right. We go back to what we talked about earlier. The reason you need to kind of dive in on this information and know your numbers is if I know I have a 50% conversion rate and I know that my goal is to have 30 units next year, then that means my goal for the year is going to be 60 listing appointments. When I break that down to a monthly goal, that means I got to get five listing appointments a month. And when I break that down to a weekly goal, it's going to mean I need one and a quarter listing appointments. Now obviously, you're not going to be able to get one and a quarter, so it's okay to round up or down, okay? So that's how you build out your 411. You break it down into a weekly goal. And the, the concept of a 411 is something that's it's with you every day. If you talk to a lot of successful agents, successful team leaders, MAPS coaches, they'll tell you they look at their 411 every Sunday night while they're planning the week. They check it against their calendar, right? They look on there. Did, did they – put enough time for lead generation based on the number of returns they get for lead generation. Did they put um, personal stuff on there? You know, you got to carve out, put everything on there. One of the best exercises for your 411 that'll help you is set out your yearly calendar up, up front. Get your calendar out and go ahead and put down holidays, vacations, uh, you're going to mega camp, family reunion, put all, all that out there so that you include all that information. So that when you're building out your weekly calendar around your 411, there's not something that pops up on you on Thursday and you go, oh crap. I said I was gonna do all my lead generation on Thursday, but I forgot Thursdays in November is my, I don't know, cookbook of the month club or whatever the heck you do, right? So be cognizant of that, build your calendar out and utilize this template, all right? Then once again, what you're going for is what do I need to do every day, every week that gets me to that monthly goal that keeps me on pace to hit my annual goal? That's the way the 411 works. So once we get through and we dive in and we, we learn how to look at our numbers and, and know our numbers through these sheets that follow, you're going to come back to this 411 and you're going to build your plan. It's okay. It's not pass fail. If you build one and you don't like it, you can edit it. You can change it. You can be flexible with it. I've looked at my 411 over the year and made adjustments because maybe I didn't think about something right or maybe I thought I was going to accomplish this or maybe I set a bar too low and I hit it early. You know, I've talked to a lot of agents that set pretty decent goals this year. And, man, starting off in the year, we all know things were a little tough. The pandemic busted out. We all had to go home for months, shut the offices down, blah, blah, blah. Then all of a sudden, the floodgates open, and everybody's been crazy busy. Both market centers that I'm involved in have had record numbers for units, for contracts written, for company dollar. It has been insanely busy and so i've talked to a lot of agents that hit their goal for the year by august right and our conversation was basically we're well, not just gonna put your feet up right we just need to kind of look at your goal and adjust and let's try to finish strong let's try to crank out so your 411 
is not a one-time thing. It's a living, breathing document that you can go back, attack, adjust, make edits to, and that you need to spend time in, if not daily, at least weekly. If you want a great planner, if you're old school and you like to write things down in a planner, um, the Bold 411 planner, uh, Carolyn bought me one this year, it was really neat. I am trying to shift away from written stuff, I'm trying to go all digital because I'm tired of carrying around all this paper, but if you like it, utilize that, okay? So that's your 411. Questions around the 411? Thoughts, feedback, struggle? Jerry, do you use a 411? Surely you do, you've been through this class. How often would you say you look at your 411? Quarterly. At least quarterly. Okay. So she goes back in and checks on it and says, did I hit my numbers? What do I need to do in the next three months to get me back on track, right? Maybe she needs to make some adjustments. I'll tell you this, if you do it and you live by it, one of the most fun things about it is when you're crossing stuff off. When you had that yearly goal or you had that monthly goal and you cross it off, right? I had several of those on my 411 this year that we've managed to cross off and I, it feels so good. All right, so it, it, will, it will really, you'll enjoy it if you do that. Okay, so here we go. Here's the meat. This is where we're gonna start doing math. Just kidding, not too much math. It's okay, don't give me that look here. Just give me the evil eye. Like, I'm not doing any math around here. I didn't come to, I didn't come to math class. So just she, she likes math. Yeah, really. <laughs> she, I don't know. She, <laughs> That's just her uh, normal pace. Oh. Her regular RBF. Okay. okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> For those of you listening at home, if you didn't hear that, that's just how Ariel looks all the time. So <laughs> it's okay. Sorry. That's why we love it. You want to okay. love it. Yeah. All right. So let's start with the actual. Okay. Not the pro form. So we start with page 19. All right, on page 19, it gives you step-by-step -step instructions to work through this worksheet. Now, for this one, what we're gonna do is we're gonna pretend that we're an agent shooting for $100,000 net income for the year. We'd all like to make 100K, right? Pretty good year. So we're gonna do that for this, and then you're gonna take page 20, and you're gonna, once you've done it through this, you understand the exercise, you're gonna actually put your numbers in to page 20, and use the pro forma to help you project, okay? So, let's talk about your economic model actual on page 19. Begin by writing your net income goal. Well, we all know our net income goal for this exercise is $100,000, right? So I wanna make 100K, that's my net goal. All right. Step two, divide your net income by 40% to calculate total GCI and write this number down. So somebody's got a calculator out, take 100,000 and divide it by 0. 0.4. I'm sorry? No, don't multiply it times 0. 0.4. Take 100,000 and divide it by 0. 0.4. 250,000, right? Okay. So we're gonna write that down as our total GCI. So we need 250,000 gross commission income to get that 100,000 net goal, okay? So multiply your gross commission income by 30% for both operating expenses and cost of sale. Well, that's pretty easy math. We know that this is gonna be 75K. Oh, that's 7K. If you make 100,000 with only 7,000 expenses, good job. Super proud of you. Didn't mean to write that. So 75K for expenses, 75K cost of sales. Okay. So, and 250K first commission income. So, we know that as we're looking at page 19, if we want $100,000 net income and we're following the 40, 30, 30 model for our business, it's gonna be 75,000 expenses, 75,000 cost of sales, 250 GCI. Now, I'll tell you a couple things about this. If you're an individual agent, you can make 100,000 without getting to the 250 gross commission income, right? 75,000 is a lot of expenses, but if you do it right, and, and as we look at these numbers, you'll understand, you may end up having to hire an admin. So you may have to lay out this money. Your cost of sales should not be 75,000, okay? Because once again, you can use technology to, 
to, to trim that down these days. If you're an individual agent, your cost of sales is probably going to be your cap, your royalty. That's going to be about it. Okay. But for the 40, 30, 30, to keep it simple, we're going to stick with the model. So we know we need 100,000 net income. We know we're going to have about 150 cost of sales and expenses. So we need 250 gross commission income for us to walk away with $100,000. All right. And, and you'll run into this problem. Agents that don't do these activities, they think they made 100,000 because they closed a gross commission income of 110,000. But by the time they paid their cap, the board dues, expenses, gas, uh, you know, whatever else they're using, virtual admin, transaction coordinator, et cetera, et cetera. What really happened is, yeah, they grossed 110,000 in commission income, but they made 50 or 60. Okay. So knowing your numbers gives you an honest look at what you have to do to achieve what you want. Remember on that first page, we said, how much money do you need to live the life you want to live and to service the debt you have to, to cover your entire operation? If that number is 100,000 and you only bring home 60, you're 40,000 in the hole. So you have to understand these numbers and we're going to build a plan around it. Okay. So we're going to assume that your average commission for this exercise is $6,000. Okay. So we have a $6,000 average commission. Okay. AC is average commission, not area of All right. Uh, so if we have, write in your average commission amount, so we know that's $6,000 now, divide your total GCI by your average commission amount to calculate the number of units to be sold. So we need to know how many units at $6,000 a pop does it take to get to 250 gross commission income. So who's got a calculator out? Do a quick one for me. 250,000 divided by 6,000 is? 41.6. Okay. Jerry, have you ever sold 0.6 of a house? <laughs> All right, we're going to go ahead and call it 42 then to keep the math. All right, so 42 houses. You're going to need to close 42 units. If you're running off the model and you're averaging 6,000 gross commission, you're going to need to close 42 units to make your $100,000. Okay, so right now, everybody in their head is thinking about, especially individual agents, they're thinking about how many units did I do? Is that really accurate? Does he know what he's talking about? It will fluctuate. This is why we're going to show you the easy math model, and then you're going to use this page to put your numbers in and calculate them. You may very well be averaging 9,000 gross commission, which would require a lot less units, right? So for easy math, yes, ma'am. Well, so if you're new, best practices is to essentially take what the average commission for your market center would be. So like on our trends, I think our average sales price last month here was 193,000, I think is what it was. It was very close to that. So you can ballpark these numbers at 200, right? And that's, that's another, I'm glad you asked that because once again, we're not, this is not the end all be all pass fail, right? So if you're a new agent, you're doing this for the first time, work off of what your market center's average sales price was, Take the gross commission from that, and it's a good roadmap to start. You, you may find, if you revisit it monthly or quarterly or weekly, that you are or not on pace for those numbers, and you can always go back and do this exercise again to update. But that's a great question. If you don't have a history of these numbers, then take what the average agent's doing here, put yourself in that category, and work hard to accomplish that, okay? All right, so... We've done that, now we need to calculate the rest of the formulas. If you don't know your split between the sell side and buy side, use an estimate or use the MRE example of 50-50. So what we know is, all right, we know that on average, you're gonna to wanna to carry, most agents are gonna carry a combination of 50% listings and 50% buyers. Now, in this current market, I would say that that's not really accurate. I would say right now, even if your listings focused, you're probably still 40, 60, and the 60 is buyers because we just have a lot more buyers than we have sellers. But some of the things we talked about in the lead generation activities, if you undertake those next year, you're going to be one of the ones that carries more listings than you do buyers. And remember, we always want to be listing focused because listings help us have a more predictable business. If I know I'm consistently going on four appointments a month, I consistently get two of them. And I know that I'm always carrying this inventory of two listings. And I know that every time I sell one, it's worth $6,000 to me. And it's easier for me to say, okay, I can predict my income. 
if I'm working with a bunch of buyers, you're, you might write 10 contracts with a buyer before you get them bought. They might get frustrated and not buy. The buyer side is far less predictable. So that's why we'll always coach you to try to have a 50-50 or a 60-40 listing split for a healthy business, but it's okay if you can't. For today's exercise, we're going to do the math assuming it's a 50-50 balance, okay? So as we work down page 19, 50% of buyer-seller listing sold and 50% of sell, oh, I'm sorry, 50% of buyer listings sold and 50% of seller listings sold, okay? So you put in 50 there at the little X, the little X right? So we're going to come down here and put 50%. If you're following along at home, Elise, can you point to what I'm talking about for them with the cursor so they kind of know where, where we're at? So we're putting 50, 50, and both, you know what, guys? I keep forgetting this is up on the student TVs as I'm writing everything down. So put your 50% here and your 50% here, all right? Now we know our total unit sold goal is 42. So what's our total seller listing sold goal? If it's 50% of 42, there you go, 21, Jamie. You guys back in the back, be a little more confident with those answers, right? Is it, like, that can't be that simple, right? Doesn't just want me to divide 42 and a half. Yes, I do. This, part of this exercise in this class is designed to remove the mystery and the pressure from these activities so that you see it's a very easy process and you're not intimidated by, well, it couldn't be that simple. There has to be something harder, right? So 50%. So we know that we're going to need 21 total seller listings and we're going to need 21 total buyer listings sold, right? So we're going to need to sell that balance to hit our 42, okay? So what's your percentage sold conversion rate? So your percentage sold conversion rate is how many of the listings do you get sell? All right. Now, I know right now it's practically 100%. If you've got a listing in this market that's not selling, it's one of a, of a very few reasons. Okay. There are little bitty pockets within municipalities, like the example I gave earlier, where prices are being screwy because someone's come in and built cheaper houses or some other factor has dropped the overall price. But the reality is, right now, if it's not selling, it's probably what overpriced, right? I mean, that's, that's number one with a bullet. If anything right now has a sign in the yard and anywhere near the right price, it's getting offers because everyone has buyers that they just can't get. All right, now all the important stuff. No, I'm just kidding, Jim. Oh, all right, so, so we're going to assume for the argument of this, to keep our math simple, that you have a 75% conversion rate so that every time you take four listings, you sell three of them. Does that make sense? and that every time you work with four buyers, you write three contracts. So we're gonna put up here 75% in both sides, both the buy and sell side, okay? So we know we need to get to 21. Of course I have it, I gotta write it down. And we know that we converge 75% of the time. Conversion. So if I know that I want 21 listings sold and I have a 75% conversion rate, then how many total listings will I need? Looking at you. 28, right? 28, because if we're gonna sell 75% of them, 75% of 28 is 21, right? So in your total seller listings needed, you're going to need 28 and 28, okay? So you put down 28 on both sides, and that's gonna help you understand your numbers. And guys, this is all about understanding our, uh, our, our numbers. Mm, I need a drink, hold on, I'm getting dry. Mm. All right, <clears throat> so, Let's talk conversion rates. Your conversion rate is going to be all over the map. If you're a newer agent, once again, you should probably assume about a 50% conversion rate. You're not going to get them all. If you're an experienced agent, you probably know your conversion rate better, and you're probably converting more for several reasons. First of all, the longer you've been in the business, the more referral and repeat business you get. So you're going to have a higher conversion rate with those. You're going to be way better at your scripts. You're going to be way better at your, at your, your game of how to achieve it. So you're going to know, so you might have a 75% conversion rate for this. We're going to assume a 50% of 
appointment conversion rate, which means if I go on four listing appointments, I get two of them, okay? If I go on four buyer consultations, I'm gonna get two of them to sign a buyer's agency with me. So we're gonna call it a 50% appointment conversion rate. Elise, can you um, up me a little bit here so we can see over the, a little bit more? There you go, thank you, homie. All right, so we know we have a 50% conversion rate, okay? So now we get down to the gist of it, all right? And we've done all of this because we need to know how many appointments we need to go on next year to achieve our goal. It all comes down to lead gen and appointments. If you're not going on appointments, you're not getting business. So everything that we do has to be funneled, funneled through the appointments. If you take Ignite, there's a funnel in the book, right? It goes, it goes uh, leads, appointments, um, agreements, contracts, money, it, it funnels it down, right? So the, the first thing though, is you gotta be throwing those appointments in, right? So if I know I have a 50% conversion rate and I know I need to get 28 of them, then, then how many appointments do I need to go on to get 28 listings, Skylar? Mm, 40, 50, 40. You're close, 56. 28 times two, yeah. right? Yeah, that's exactly right though. You did the math right. This is why we do it. It's because really it seems, guys, when you look at this, it seems so complicated, but once we do it, it's so much easier to boil it down, right? So what we need for total seller appointments and total buyer appointments to follow this model is gonna be 56 appointments with each, okay? Now, Skylar, I'm gonna keep picking on you. How many weeks a year are you planning to work? 52 weeks in the year, are you gonna work all of them? Uh, you're gonna work 50, you're gonna take two weeks off. 48, slacker, <laughs> somebody call Ferguson, tell her this girl's taking a month off, what is this? 52, take her here. Nah, nah, too late, you said 48, okay. All right, so Skylar, how many appointments do you need to achieve your goals? Oh my goodness, okay. Um, 42. I was throwing that out there. <laughs> okay, that's, like, that's great. And, and, and if you're throwing it out for the reason because 42 is the answer to everything? Yes. Because you read The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? Excellent. All right. That's awesome. You get bonus points for that reference. That's pretty deep. That's a deep nerd reference. I love it. However, that is wholly wrong. Okay. Wah, wah. okay. That's not accurate. All right. Skylar, I need 56 appointments with listings and 56 appointments with buyers. How many do I need? So, oh, 112, sorry. That's right, 112. Okay, somebody help Skylar out. Grab your calculator. She's going to work 48 weeks next year. She has 112 divided by 48. How many appointments does she need every week? 2.3. I'm sorry? 2.3. 2.3, all right? 2.3. So you need to have between two and three appointments every week for 48 weeks to achieve your goal based on what should be pretty realistic conversion percentages throughout, right? You give yourself 50-50. So guys, the whole point of this exercise is to achieve clarity around your business, around the numbers you're trying to achieve. And to be honest with you, when we're talking about these big numbers, they say, oh man, I, don't, I can't do that. Two to three appointments a week doesn't sound like that much, does it sound? That's not even one a day, right? By contrast, if you're trying to have 100 units, uh, then you have to double those numbers, right? We were 42, so I mean, it can get bigger. You know, to give you an insight into my world, they want me to try to have uh, 50 appointments a month, right? Not counting classes and everything else. Now, thankfully, as a team leader, uh, they, you know, they don't make that all big agents. Some of them are small agents. Some of them are my own agents. But still, that's a lot of appointments. And all of us team leaders, we fall short. You're not going to be perfect. You're not ever going to hit every goal, and that's okay in absence of perfection except production. If you have clarity around your numbers, if you build a plan and you know what the goal is, and you come to the end of the next year, Skylar, and you had 100 appointments, that's a good year. Just because you missed your goal by 12, you should not consider yourself a failure, right? You should, you should endeavor to hit your goal. You should want to grow into it. But don't look at these and feel like you're setting yourself up for failure. Don't look at these numbers or set your goals and say, oh my God, I don't know if I can achieve that. That's okay. Not everyone whose goal is climbing Mount Everest reaches the top. 
getting to base camp is still a pretty nice accomplishment, right? Still a pretty nice view from base camp, right? So, you know, uh, but, but you don't get to Everest without a plan, without training, without knowing your numbers, without understanding how much oxygen you need, all those things. You don't just hop on a plane to Nepal and say, hey, I'm going to go climb Mount Everest. I mean, I'm sure there is somebody who's dumb enough and rich enough to do that, but I would bet you money they did not make it to the top, right? So, all right, questions around this worksheet. Let's dig in a little deeper because you're going to do this with your own numbers. When we get done, you're going to go back and do this with your own numbers to help you set your plan. So questions around this. Does everyone feel like you could fill one out blankly? How about online? Do we got questions online? Anybody got a question on here? Did I go too fast? Is anyone still listening? You can never tell on Zooms, you know, because they, they shut off their little, their little camera. And so you just see their picture, you know. That's it. Maybe they're listening. Maybe you're muted and they're playing Xbox. So, all right. Which is what I would be doing if I was an agent. I would totally be muted and play next one. <laughs> I was, I was such a, uh, I, I was uh, a terrible agent. You know, I mean, I, I sold houses. I was good to my clients, but man, I was always just like, yeah, whatever, man. I'm listening. You know, I get it. It's boring sometimes. I didn't appreciate the value of all the systems and models until I came to Keller Williams, and it totally changed my life. And I've made more money with Keller Williams than I had ever made in my life. Oh, Wendy's listening. There you go. Thank you, Wendy. Is there a way we can move her up in the camera scroll? She should get top position there. All right, so this is how you do it, guys. This is how you know your numbers. All right, when we get done and you're building your plan, take this and put your numbers. So back to her question from earlier, if you're a newer agent and you don't know your numbers, just look up our office trends, look up our reports, look up on the MLS. Just look at your, your MLS and take a look at what the average sales price for Branson is. It's okay to use averages as you grow. You got to start somewhere. You need a baseline, right? That's how you do it. So that's pages 19 and 20. Okay, let's talk business plan. Page 21. How are we doing on time? Oh, we're doing great. You guys are a lot less chatty than Monday's group. That is that is not a bad thing. So we're not chasing rabbits. We're doing good on time. We'll give you guys back some time in your afternoon, hopefully. All right. <clears throat> so how many contacts are needed to achieve the goals of my economic model? So remember, on page 19, we worked on our economic model, all right? And we said that to achieve these numbers, we need 112 total appointments, okay? So contacts needed to achieve the goals of my economic model, are, our economic model showed us that we were trying to get 42 units. Now, in the old days, and even now, you'll hear people talk about different numbers around a database. In the Red Book, I believe it says for every 50 names in your database, and you work it right, that you will therefore get a, a closing. That's probably pretty accurate, right? Isn't that what it says, Jerry? It's 50 names well worked in your database equals one closing is, is how it goes. So somebody real quick tell me if i'm trying to achieve 42 closings how many names do i need in my database what's 42 times 50. skylar stop trying to do it in your head it's just, <laughs> she's sitting there looking at like i want to carry the one and let me take my shoe off and 20, no. 2100 okay 2100 so this is a great place. One of my favorite classes is a productivity coach. I'm going to pause here and, and throw you in the Wayback Machine. One of my favorite classes to teach was um, Double Your Database, right? Uh, followed closely by Ignite Number 2, which was Build Your Database. I'm all about your database because your database is your business, right? If you don't have a database, you don't have a business yet. You have a license to be in business, but you don't have a business yet. If you have a database and it's not 2,100 people, that's okay. We're going to talk about a couple quick tricks. So, does anybody have their command available pretty quick? Because command is your database. That's where you run your business. Now, someone like Jerry's been in business a long time. Jerry, do you use command? Do you have a different CRM? Command. Command. All right, Jerry, can you tell me how many contacts are in your database? 4,057. 4 All right, that is a tremendous achievement. That's somebody who had a really healthy, long-term built database that she brought over into command. So, it's going to be harder for me to double hers, but we could talk about some ways to do it, right? So for most of us, I'm guessing that if you looked in your command, your personal command, don't you guys don't grab Ann Ferguson. Just look at your personal command. Don't be, don't be looking up Ann. You don't get credit for her. 
All right. I'm guessing you're somewhere around a couple hundred. We had someone in here yesterday for uh, when I did the Rising Stars and we talked about this with them. They mentioned that they had 168 people. Okay. So, Ariel, did you look up your personal command? Yeah. How many contacts are in it? 733. 733. Okay, that's pretty good. So here's what I want you to do. Ariel, do you have an iPhone? Do you have a smartphone of some sort? Yes. Does it have a contact list? Yes. Open that up. Scroll down to the bottom for me. How many contacts are in that contact list? Does it give you that number? Well, I also have Nikki's in there. So. You have Nikki's contacts in your phone? Yeah. Okay, all right. So, how many contacts are in there? I get just to mine, and then I have only 200. Only 200? What about you and Nikki? Mm -hmm. I All right. She's she can't find her number. So I'll give you an example. On mine, I have 1262 contacts in my phone, right? The reason I ask is in double the database class, one of the first things that the instructor will do is say, okay, how many names you got? All right, how many are in your phone? And almost without fail, and this happened yesterday, and it's a little tougher when you're on a team or you're an admin because you may have other people's contacts involved with your stuff. But right there, you can double your database by adding all the names in your phone. How about Facebook friends, right? I know a lot of people that have 2,000 Facebook friends, but only 800 names in their database. Not everybody that goes to your database has to be your best friend, but if you're looking to grow the amount of names, email addresses, leads, contacts that you're working, you gotta go to these places where the other things are, right? So, we'll pick on Ariel for a minute. Ariel, we know she has 700 contacts in her database. I think you said like 720, but we'll call it 700 because I like easy math because I'm not that right. So, 700 contacts, but Ariel's goal was 42 units, which Skylar's math told me I need 2,100 contacts by the month, okay? So we've got to get Ariel, one of Ariel's goals next year to help her achieve her 42 units has to be to multiply her database from 700 up to 2100. Now, how do you do that? Well, Facebook Lead Accelerator, you can add a lot of contacts there. You know, they won't all be buyers now, but you don't need them all to buy now. You need them all to buy sometime. You're in this for the long run. It's the infinite game. You're building a business. If they don't buy today, they might buy tomorrow, but they're not ever going to buy from you unless you're marketing to them and touching them and, and communicating with them, right? We talked about a story yesterday, my old broker, before I joined Keller Williams, my old broker was not good for a lot of things, but he did throw the occasional tidbit of excellent wisdom out there if you knew how to listen to him. And he used to tell this story about an agent that worked for him. And this agent was dedicated. They sent every month, everyone in their database got a little card with a recipe on it. Every month, like clockwork, boy, they. They really did a good job. They stayed on that. That was their thing. And then one day, one of her clients called and said, hey, we want to give you our new address. We, we sold our old house and bought a new one. And we want to make sure that we still get our recipe of the month card, right? So it's not just about how you touch your database. It's about are you working it right, right? Are you touching it enough times? Are you, are you hitting it 36? I mean, that lady, imagine the, the chagrin and she's like, oh my gosh, here I thought I was working my database. These people bought and sold with someone else, okay? So it's all about working your database, if you're, and so you're going to need them over a period of time, right? And our statistics teach us that everyone you know knows about two to four deals a year, okay? So if you know 100 people that you're working right, you're one referral away from 400 transactions. Now forget this 42 unit stuff. Yeah, that's nice. That's nice, I, I like to do 42 units, individual aging, make good money. What if you do 400? Does this sound impossible? Well, we can help you build a team, we can help you get there if you're working your database right and you're getting all their referrals, right? And, and if you think about it, it's the truth. You all know somebody who's got married or divorced, 
whose kids went off to college or whose family got bigger or who lost their job or got a new job or moved or blah, 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 blah. They needed real estate transactions, right? So it's all about growing up that database. So on my business plan, and we can, you can uh, make notes on this and come back and use this sheet, or you can make the notes in the sheet and then come back. But as we go through my business plan, we know to achieve our goal of 42 units, we're gonna need approximately 2,100 contacts in our database worked right to achieve those numbers. Now, before you think, I don't know, I closed 40 deals, but I don't have that many in there. I'll bet if we dug in, you have a sphere, uh, a network uh, between social media and the, the mommy and me class and your softball team and your church uh, barbershop quartet. I assume that's what you're into, Skylar. Um, then, you know, you probably do have that many people in your world. You just maybe don't have it streamlined into your CRM. So we know we need 2,100 contacts. We know that Ariel has 700 contacts in her database today. So she needs to add 1,400 contacts to her database to achieve her long-term goal, right? So once again, we break that down. We eat the elephant one bite at a time. You know how I eat an elephant? One bite at a time. You get that elephant in your mouth. It's crazy. So if we know she needs 1,400, then somebody do real quick 1,400 divided by 12. 116.6. Not you. You already have the answers. I didn't have the answers. Peter, she's cheating, everybody. Lisa's cheating. Okay. She was in this class Monday. So it's 116.6, you said? Okay. So we'll call it 117. So we know she needs to add 117 names a week. Okay. How does she do that? Well, let's break it down a little. Or no, I'm sorry. We know she needs to add 117 a month. Okay. What does that break down to? Divide that by four, Elise. Uh, 29.25. See, she didn't even do it with a calculator. She yes, reading. I did. Do you want to see uh, it? What right. is that? So she needs to add 30 a week. That's okay. So she needs to add 30 a week. Okay, so now on your 411, when we go back and we look at the 411 example on page 17, and we're doing our own on page 18, you see it's got other things. Add number of contacts to your monthly goals. Your monthly goal needs to say 117. Your each week goal is going to need to say 30, right, to get you there. And so you can break it down. 30 sounds like a ton, but it's really not. We run ads all the time to the Facebook Lead Accelerator to get 10, 12, 15, 20 different contacts, 30 different contacts. There are ways to build this. You can have, uh, you know, social media that sends out. You can have open houses. You can have contests. You can do so many different things to grab these numbers. And, and we can talk about that deeper in a database-based class. But the reality is her goal to achieve what we're building with the plan is going to be 30 each week. Okay. Now, if you've taken Ignite or you've been around Keller Williams for a minute, I hope you've heard of the Daily 10-4, right? What we're coming to is a point where we see that to achieve these numbers, to achieve $100,000 a year, really all you need is the Daily 10-4. If you're executing a Daily 10-4, that should knock it out. That should achieve these numbers. We'll talk about that in a second. So what's your lead generation sources? So somebody give me a couple of sources you're, lead, you're using right now for lead generation. Facebook, all right, that's a great one. So we got Facebook. What else we got? Market leader. Oh yeah, oh, those of us that have been around for a minute loved our market leader. I loved mine, man. My market leader was the bomb. I, I miss it. Don't miss what I paid me for, but I miss it. All right, so we got Facebook, right? We got market leader, got all these little initials. All right, what's something else? Jerry, what's somebody like you do? What's one of your lead generation sources? Door knocking, right? Old school, never fails. Talk to anybody who succeeded and at some point in their career, I bet you they've knocked on a door, all right? So um, one more current lead gen source. What do we got? We got door knocking, we got Facebook, we've got market leader, right? We use that as our CRM. What's something else you're doing to get leads? Open houses. Open houses. Hey, I love that one. That's a good one. Open houses. All right. I also heard Jerry say texting, right? And why I like what Jerry said was these are platforms for lead generation. So, so they're, they're lead generation sources, but at the heart of it, lead gen is communication, right? 
Jerry, texting is a word that can capture it all. You could also put in calling, right? You could put in emailing. You could put in popping by. It's communication, right? You don't get 100% of the business of, of the people you don't talk to, right? You get, you get none of it if you're not out there having those conversations, okay? Future lead gen sources. What are things you've been wanting to try? All right. And when you're building your plan, you don't just need to don't don't just rest on your laurels, right? Pro athletes, sprinters, football players, when they get to a point where they can run a four, five, forty, or bench three hundred pounds, do they stop working out? No, no, they tune it up. I watched this. I got married recently, and one of the things you learn when you get married is sometimes you have to watch stuff you don't want to watch on TV to keep everybody happy. Right. So, and, and you, you see the ladies giggling because, you know, it's funny. When I want to watch the Cowboy game, my, my wife just says, yeah, enjoy that. I'm going to get my nails done. But when she wants to watch something, she says, sit down. We're watching this. Right. So it's, that's why all the ladies are laughing. So last night we watched this thing about a plant-based diet. And if you haven't seen it, I think it was on Netflix. Go watch it. It's somewhat entertaining. But one part that was interesting was, they had the Tennessee Titans on there. You guys know what the Tennessee Titans are. It's an NFL football team. Used to be the Houston Oilers, and Tennessee stole them from Texas and moved them to, to Tennessee. Um, I think they're outside of Nashville now, I guess. So the point is, they had interviewed these guys because they, a bunch of their players, the year that they finally got good and went to the playoffs, had gone on plant-based diets. And they were talking about their energy and all this. And the conversation my wife and I had was, you know, these are the most finely tuned athletes in the world. So they were already in great shape, but they were still looking for that other edge. So no matter how good your current lead gen sources are when you're doing your plan, don't think that what you did this year will be enough, and don't think that's the only thing you can do, and don't get stodgy. You've got to look into the future. What are you not good at that you'd like to be better at? Are you terrible about sending the handwritten notes you, should, you know you should? Okay, put that on your 411 to make yourself write those notes, right? Are you, man, I'll, I'll email anybody, I'll text anybody, and I'll, I'll totally do Facebook, but I am not calling anybody. Then call. I'll tell you right now, guys, with the new agent yesterday, we talked about it. We can help you grow your business if you'll do at least one thing, right? I can multiply any number in the world times zero. It's going to get a zero. But if you'll do at least one thing, we can start multiplying that and get you somewhere, right? So think about that thing that you know you should do. How about door knocking? When she said door knocking, somebody in here, I know because I've done this long enough, I know that somebody in here heard door knocking and thought, I don't want to do that. New agent. Yeah. Better tell you the story. Did you have a horror story door knocking? No. Um, I wasn't really thrilled about it. But then, I mean, honestly, I thought about it. We bought a house in 2015 and nobody has ever door knocked us. I don't get mailers in the mail. Nothing. Mm -hmm. So we, I have a client who's looking for that Lakeview home. So we pick the neighborhood in Ridgeview to go door knock, literally saying we have a client who would love to live in this neighborhood. Sure. Boom. We've gotten one already on the market. And so I have to have that. And Absolutely. Five days. Yep, five days. The guys, the proof is in the pudding. And, 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 and honestly, you know, what I'm hearing is, she lead generated. She undertook an activity and she got results. There's not a one for one in our business. There's nothing I can tell you to do that every time you do it, you'll get a deal as far as you knock on one door, you list one house. But I can tell you, if you knock on a neighborhood, you're going to get some business, right? Uh, you can also work on your scripts and learn those numbers as well. And what we're going to do going to the next break is we're going to mastermind around this a little bit is let's talk about these lead generation sources. So we talked about a few currents. We talked about some future, right? The, the door knocking is a great example, okay? But sometimes we don't want to go door knock. When I was an agent, especially when I was a coach, I found with new agents, if you could give them a purpose or if you could give them something that didn't feel cold call or sales me, they were more willing to do that, right? So none of us want to call somebody and say, hey, you know anybody looking to buy or sell real estate? I mean, it's part of our game. You need to be able to ask that question and have that conversation. But if I tell you, make a list of 100 people, call them and have that it, you immediately are just going to go, well, I, don't, I, don't, I won't do that, right? especially for a newer agent, okay? But what she did was she didn't knock on her door and say, hi, would you like to sell your house? She knocked on her door and brought value. Hey, we have people looking in this neighborhood. Are you at all interested in selling? It's just like we talked about the renters. Are you calling rental people and saying, 
I got buyers coming out of my ear. Any chance you want to offload this thing? Does this investment run its course? Would you like to look at how much you can walk away from the table with? Let me do a CMA for you, if nothing else. Doesn't cost you anything, and you'll be aware of what your investment. You know, you bring that value. Hey, my so I mentioned earlier, if we're trying to achieve that, your goal, your minimum goal when you're building your plan for lead generation next year needs to be a daily 10-4. Can anybody tell me what a daily 10-4 is? 10 contacts made, absolutely. All right, what else? 10 names added to your day. Boy, look at old hand Jerry over there knocking it out of the park. 10 names added to DB. All right. 10 handwritten notes. I apologize for my terrible handwriting. Handwriting. I have terrible grammar as well. Handwriting. And. <laughs> it's okay. That's all right. You know what? She did three out of four. I'll give her a pass. The last one is you need to preview two homes a day, five days a week. That gives you that fourth 10, right? So 10 homes previewed. Per week. So, you know, Keller Williams, we love to name our stuff the daily 10 four, right? So every day I need to be making 10 contacts. I need to be putting 10 names in my database. I need to be writing 10 notes. Now these days, guys, there's a bit of an age line. If, if you've got 50, 60 year old people in your database, you're leeching, send them handwritten notes. If you've got 20 and 30 year old people, the modern handwritten note is like a direct Facebook message, right? Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a little bit more intimate of a contact. It's not just a post, right? But it is still a, a communication that, that, that involves another step. So it still makes feel. So don't eliminate handwritten notes, but understand, you know, that things have changed. Also, there's a lot of success with text messages today. Jerry mentioned earlier texting. When you're making your 10 contacts, we used to say 10 calls. If you're calling and texting a combination of 10 people a day consistently, that's efficient. So you got your daily 10 four. All right. Martin. Ah, oh, you heard me that time. <laughs> I wanted to touch base on the door knocking. I saw a Facebook video that was super interesting yesterday. It was an agent out of Arizona, I think, but her entire team recorded videos of places that they had buyers looking for property, asking people in that neighborhood to contact them. If they were interested in selling their homes. That is probably a safer way to approach doors right now. And you can hit a much larger area given that I'm assuming that Lake of the Ozarks and Branson are similar and it's mostly a second home market. So you can hit more of those people, that more of the people that don't live here full time if you're utilizing it online and actually knocking on the doors. Absolutely. That's a great point, right? You got to, you got to move depending on your market, depending on the scenario. So it's a great point. So digging down a little bit more on the lead gen, because I love the door knocking came out. One of the reasons when I was a coach that I was devout about the daily 10 board, we had a rule. You didn't get to ask me what's next until you were completing this every day. And we were having an accountability conversation around. It. So when you joined us and you were a new agent and you wanted, you're one of those, if there's a certain kind of personality where they're a new agent, and they need you to tell them everything before they're willing to go get any business. Well, what about this? What's next? Well, well what do I do on my taxes once I've got a seven level team? I appreciate, I appreciate your gusto, but how many contacts did you make today? Well, no, no, I didn't make any. I don't know everything. I can't teach you everything. We gotta get you paid, right? So we had a don't ask what's next rule. You weren't getting the answer until you were completing these because it's so critical. Guys, I say all the time when I'm teaching classes or I'm talking to my wife, or even sometimes when Carolyn and I get in an argument, I say, hey, look, don't tempt me. I'll go back to be a licensee. I'll do a daily 10 four every day. I'll do nothing else. I'll make hundred thousand dollars a year because if you undertake this consistently, it will lead to everything you need. Now let's talk about a couple quick cheats. Okay. Let's be purposeful with our time. Let's, let's be smart about it. One of my favorite things to do is what I call guerrilla warfare. Okay. I can tell you right now and anybody that's been in the business for a while will agree with me. There's plenty of agents that are not doing it the way they're supposed to do it. They're not doing it the way they're coached or taught. They're just out there winging it. Maybe they're making money. Maybe they're not. Maybe they've got 
some website they're paying, but they're not doing the fundamentals. And I'm a big fundamental guy. It's the coach in me, right? Yeah, when, when Michael Jordan gets done with practice, he takes a 1,000 free throw shots. LeBron takes a 1,000 free throw shots. The field goal kickers in the NFL spend all week doing nothing but kicking field goals. Even though they're the best in the world at what they do, they still practice that fundamental exercise, the snap, the hold, the kick, repeatedly, okay? So what I want to do is I want to bet that my competitions, they stay at home. Give you an example, not to pick on any of our agents, so we won't give any names. Did you see how much pizza's out there? I wasn't just winging it. We had that many people committed. A little cold rain, you know, middle of the week doldrums. Any excuse not to come? I'm not picking on our agents, but our agents are just like all agents. There's going to be a percentage that does all the business. You'll hear us say things like 20% of your people do 80% of your business, right? So one of the things that I always used to my advantage in my program was when I went out and did my two previews every day, so I would go look at House X. I got a little card I developed, and it said, uh, gosh, let me remember. It said, uh, you may have noticed your neighbor's house is for sale. If you're curious how this affects your property values going forward, please feel free to reach out to me. I'd be happy to do a market analysis on your home. We put it in a little bag for the door hanger, put a couple little pieces of candy and a business card in it, and when we went and did our previews, we would go to the two houses next door and the three houses across the street. And we'd knock on their door. And I loved it because I wasn't cold calling these people. I wasn't trying to give them anything, all right? When they answered the door, our script was very simple. Hi, my name's Martin with Keller Williams. I was previewing the house next door because I might have some buyers interested. And I was wondering, could you tell me anything you love about the neighborhood? People love to talk about themselves. They love to share their opinions. When you open the door and they, when they open the door and you ask them that, somebody's gonna go, oh yeah, no. and I love the park. And then once, once you got them off center because you're not trying to sell them anything, people are also nosy. So without fail, those conversations led to, hey, what are they selling that house for? Well, it's listed at 199. Huh, what does that do to mine? Well, I don't know, I'm not sure I haven't seen your house, but I'd be happy to see you. Maybe I'll just give your name and email, right? All of a sudden, because let me tell you something, we've all driven through our neighborhoods and I've seen her sign in the yard, right? And her sign is there in the yard and it says, My, I'm bad at pronouncing your first name, it's Myra. Mariah. It's Mariah, damn it, sorry, <laughs> I mean, sorry Mo, dang it. <laughs> Mariah, I see Mariah Westcott and what happens when Mariah sells that house? Almost invariably, the next day, Jerry Moore's sign is in the yard next to it. Now, most of the time, that's because the truth is, even though Mariah should have gone and knocked on every neighbor of her listing and tried to initiate the contact, she probably didn't. And not necessarily she didn't, but I'm using her as an example. And she didn't because it's cold or it's wet or she has something she wants to do and that's okay. But the conversations in those neighbor houses, when she put her sign up, somebody came home that afternoon and said, honey, did, did you see the neighbors are selling their house? I wonder if they're getting a divorce. Oh, I wonder how much it's worth. Oh, I wonder, hey, what do you think we can sell our house for? Those conversations happen, all right? So, so she inadvertently started real estate conversations right there around her, yet she never went to have the conversation. Jerry happened to send out a mailer to the farm that month, and they called Jerry to list their house. You see it time and time again, a, real, a different realtor's sign will go up next to the house that's sold. So, guerrilla warfare, assume your competition is not doing the fundamentals. All right, if my goal is to do a daily 10 4 and I'm planning out starting my day on the way in, previewing two homes, or maybe on the way out that afternoon, and I'm knocking on these doors, I could be knocking out half of my contacts added and half of my names right there just from doing these activities. So, when you're planning your lead gen, you need to think outside the box, you need to think about things that have worked, things that haven't worked, and you need to assume that your competition isn't doing it all the time. So oftentimes, especially with newer agents, we think, oh man, I'll never be that good. Oh man, I can't do that. Oh, well, she only gets those numbers. She's been in the business forever. The truth is, most of them, the average real estate agent closes seven deals a year across this country, I think, just, just as a broad average. So, you know, don't put everyone else's skill set up on a pedestal above you. Instead, assume that 80% of them are not out there doing what they're supposed to do. And you want to be in the 20%, okay? All right, questions around lead gen. Other thoughts, opinions, aha, feedback? Okay, 
It's two o'clock. We can push through. We can take a 10 minute break. Push through, push through wins. Okay, guys, we had a vote for push through. We're going to push through. <laughs> One vote won it. So much like this year's presidential election, only 10% of the vote or the people are going to decide the fate of everybody, right? All right. So uh, lead generation activities, we know that she needs to undertake X amount of lead generation activities in order to achieve her goal. She needs to be adding, what did we say it was, 30 or 21, 21 each week added to her database, okay? So let's talk about how you work your database. When you're setting your plan, you need to think about it in two forms, all right? You're 36 to convert touch campaign, and you're 19 to connect, okay? So you're 19 to connect. Those are with people that you haven't really gotten in yet. Those are people that you're getting off of maybe the Facebook ads, maybe an open house guest list, things like that. How are you going to approach turning those people from just random strangers whose information you've got to people that are potentially going to do business with you? You're going to make a quarterly phone call, right? You're going to send them 12 monthly emails. You're going to send them two direct mails, and you're going to invite them to one thing. Now, this does require you to work in your database to set it up properly, to curate it a little bit. You have to spend some time on your business, right? You have to tag these people. So I might tag everyone open house guests when I first get them. And then when I go to lead gen and come in and I want to send out emails to everybody for a neighborhood nurture, I can filter by that tag and pull up those people and start them on a neighborhood nurture. Come in. What's that? I saw a chat question pop up. It was on the big board. Use your smart plans. That's right. Use your smart plans, at least that's exactly where I was going. I, Close this so we don't have to. Okay. Use your smart plan. So, guys, if you haven't dove in, Command has library full of automated plans, halfway automated plans, reminder plans. Your, your virtual assistant, Kelly, will pop up on your phone and tell you, hey, dummy, call these people, right? It, it, it will simply do it for you if you'll set it up. So, if I want to send 12 emails and I've done my job, I've got their name, phone number, and address, so I've got them in my database. I can set them up on a monthly neighborhood nurture and it's going to send them a branded email, with my information and pertinent real estate information about their neighborhood, right? It's going to get hyper local and people, once again, they love to be nosy. Okay. So they're going to want to see how many houses are listed. Oh, look at that one. Hey, that's so-and-so's from down the street. I heard she's leaving. Me. They love to have those conversations. That will go. That's what goes on. Right? So you're sending them an email that they're going to read. If you're still sending the old, um, cut and copy from some title company's newsletter about how to winterize your home with weather stripping. I can tell you guys it's not getting the clicks and the opens that you think it is, right? That was handy before, but now everybody's getting 9 jillion emails from all sorts of stuff. So you have to make the information a little bit more pertinent, a little bit more hyper local expertise. Things like the neighborhood nurture email will work because it's very specific to their property. Okay. So, Promotional, direct mail, magnets, calendars, annual market report. Hey, uh, when do property taxes, when do they do here in Missouri? I'm sorry? November 15th. Okay, so they come out November 15th, they're due January 1st. All right, same thing it was in Texas. So this time of year in Texas, when we were agents, we'd be calling everybody we'd ever sold a house to saying, hey, do you need me to run a quick CMA so you can maybe protest your taxes? Right? Because people come out and say, Oh my goodness, it matters more in a state where you have high property taxes, but down there, a $300,000 house is going to cost you $9,000 a year in property taxes. So if I can get them to drop my value to two fifty dollars because I make a good argument, that's going to save me some money. So once again, I wasn't cold calling my people with a, hey, wouldn't you like to be a pepper two script? Mariah, that was an old thing people used to call and ask if they wanted to write you. You got to remember that. Jerry and I remember. Yeah. Um, so, so, you know, easy to find two reasons to give these people a call or send them a magnet. Now, your 36 convert touch campaigns, this is for your, this is for your Mets. This is the people that are already in your ally resource in your database, and they need to be getting touched by you 36 times a year in order for our numbers to work. So we go back to our lead gen model. If 2,100 contacts in my database get worked appropriately, I'm going to throw off 42 closings a year. I'm going to tell you right now, you undertake these activities consistently, guys. 
you'll get more than this, right? These numbers are great. They're a nice average. But if you're hitting this consistently, you're going to get 50, right? If you got 2,100 people that you're working everyone through the right plan, you're going to get 50 or maybe 55. You may not get 300. But I'm telling you right now, if you undertake these activities consistently, you'll beat these numbers a little bit. So once again, I'm going to call them a reporter. All right. So my 411, my business. Of course. No, man. Yeah, absolutely. This is this is come and go. Um, the most important thing I was going to say is next. So we'll have somebody write it down for you. No, I'm just kidding. No. Um, yeah, guys, if you need to go to the restroom or anything else, don't worry. We will simply make fun of you while you're gone. Um, so you're going to make a quarterly call. So if you don't have something in your business plan, when you're down to that weekly, right? I go back to that weekly number. So I need to be adding this many people. I need to make X amount of calls to generate the appointments because I know my, so on my weekly part of my 411, I'm putting in there a minimum of a daily 10 4 every day, right? Because if I'm making 50 calls and I'm, I'm working my way through it, then I'm hitting everybody with that quarterly phone call. Does that make sense? Okay, so 26 bi weekly emails offering information value to the consumer. Once again, you can set them up on a bi weekly neighborhood nurture. Guys, your technology will do the heavy lifting for you. Understand all of these touches do not have to be high quality, high grade in your face touches. All right, some of them have to be, but it needs to be a balance. The most important thing is you want to stay top of mind, right? The Red Book teaches us that most people can only remember the names of two or three brands, two or three realtors. If you think about it, that's true. Can anybody name me five brands of detergent? Maybe if we sat here and thought about it. Yeah, we've been washing clothes our whole lives, right? I mean, Tide, Gain. What? All. All. Yeah. Purell. Is that a detergent? Okay, see, she beat me, right? So so it, it's it's brand awareness, right? We we only have spot. Why do you think Amazon sends you a thousand emails and Netflix sends you a thousand emails? And guys, I encourage you, sometimes we think in terms of this, we say, I don't want to bug my people 26 times a year. Let me tell you something. You'll be lucky if you register on their radar with only 26 emails a year. Since we've been talking, Amazon sent me three emails. Just to check in, right? I, I, bet, I bet you might. I get, I, I've gotten where I, if you send me an email, the subject line needs to be good because I don't have time to open and read all these. I currently have 29,194 unread emails, and I delete all my emails on January 1st each year. So that's just in the last 10 months, okay? And it's not all agents I'm ignoring, although some of them maybe. No, I'm just kidding. It, it is just, it's, it's Amazon, it's Netflix, it's Google, it's Sling, it's YouTube, it's blah, 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 blah. So don't think in terms of, oh my gosh, this is a lot. Think in terms of, that's a bare minimum just to kind of keep you front of mind, okay? Two events, get togethers and parties, four promotional direct mail accounts. So when you're laying out your plan, and we talked about when you're going to build your business plan and you're going to think about your 411, you need to take next year's calendar and lay it out all the way. When are you having these events? What are you doing for your clients and when are you having it? That, that's part of planning for next year. Don't wait until you get to September and say, oh, oh I know, I wanna have a, a costume Zoom. I want everybody to get on the Zoom with me and then we'll post a picture of a costume and I'll go with it. By the time you put it together, it'll be Thanksgiving, right? Is, you've gotta plan ahead, you gotta have that plan. So plan out your calendar and, and remember, What's my two events going to be? Are they going to be in person? Am I going to have, I've known agents that threw off 40, 50 deals a year and all they did was throw three parties a year. Throw three big old parties a year for all the people they know. And boy, the referrals just poured in. They just networked and you, you can build your business. The beauty of our business is it is the ultimate million ways to skin a cat business. Now the cat never changes. So it's the real estate deal, right? It's the buying and selling of a piece of real estate. But the how you skin it, oh my Lord, there is a million different things. I guarantee you, you spend enough time in this business, you'll talk to people that close 60 units a year and they, you, they couldn't tell you how. Now, a lot of times when I'm coaching somebody like that and they'll say, well, I don't know what, it just falls in my lap. I'll say, well, no, no, Mariah, it doesn't fall in your lap. I appreciate your humility. I appreciate that, but the reality is you lead generate in a different way. You're not strong on the phone game, 
but you're at every function at your school and church and you network really hard and you follow up and show people you care and, and, and communicate and that's where you get your business. You know, nobody lucks into 60 a year. Hey, you'll, you'll luck into two or three. I've even known some people that lucked into seven or eight. In fact, the people that luck into the most, would you like to guess what they're doing when they luck into them? Door knocking. You know how many stories I used to hear as a coach where people would come back and say, Martin, you're not going to believe it. I finally went out, and I know you've been bugging me, so I finally went out, so I'm going to knock on doors. And I started knocking on doors, and I was knocking down this, and I had done what you said, and I'd set up a preview of this house. So I went around and knocked on the doors, and I went and previewed that house. And when I came out of that house that was for sale, somebody pulled up on the curb and said, hey, are you a realtor? We'd like to buy this house. And it really happens. It really happens. I'm not promising you every time you go preview a home, somebody's going to show up with a bucket of money. But I'm telling you, I used to hear that story consistently that an agent would be out there previewing a home, doing what they're supposed to do on the ground. And somebody would pull up and say, hey, we're really interested. You know, it, it does happen. So, so once again, are they lucky or were they doing what they were supposed to be doing? And, you know, that's that old luck is where preparation meets opportunity, right? Anybody ever heard that? Is that right? Am I saying that right? I don't think I am. I don't. It's a, a old football coach used to say that. All right. So that is how we're going to plan for our touches. We're doing good on time. All right, Elise, give me a scroll up. Let's talk budget model, okay? So when we're budgeting with our budget model and we're looking at page, yeah, page 22, you can use this to play around your budget and the MREA. So begin with your GCI goal from your economic model. So we know that our GCI goal was $100,000 based on today's model, right? This is what we're working on is $100,000 income, okay? So, 100K is our goal income, we know that. So, we're gonna enter the values for your budget plan based on your GCI and how you run your business, okay? So, our gross, oh, I'm sorry, your gross commission income goal was 250, not our net income goal, our gross commission income, because this is about the budget. So our gross commission income goal was 250, and we were trying to achieve $100,000 income, right? So we know that we needed to do 42 units, that's 6,000 units to get to 250, and then we were gonna cut our expenses and our cost of sales and everything out of it, and what was left was gonna be 100. So as we work down through this, you take that 250,000, and you say, okay, what percentage of GCI should this be, okay? So in this case, we're going to use a 5% model because your listing percent, your listing specialist and, and buyer specialist, this is for teams on the top of the page. So we're not going to do that with you guys because what we're doing is an individual thing. So we know that for that top one, for cost of sales, you need to write in your cap and your royalty. Now, if you're Jerry and you have agents on your team that you may or may not be paying salaries to or things like that, that's when... That's when the 5%, 25%, that's when the cost of sales model applies. But if you're a newer agent, it's not going to apply to you. So when you're making your plan, you need to just assume your cap, okay? If you're a husband and wife team, I know Jody and Mark are on here. I don't know if they, um, they're, husband, they're married, right? Or they're getting married? They're engaged. So husband and wives get to uh, split a cap, all right? So you might do a budget for each of you, or you might do a budget together, depending on how you run your business. Well, your cap and your royalty goes in your cost of sales, okay? Then we come down to the expenses, all right? Now, once again, it's going to depend on who you are. If you have an admin, well, then you may have compensation for that admin as an expense. If you don't have an admin and you're still paying someone, come talk to me. That doesn't make any sense, right? So, no, it, it could happen. Lead generation should be 9% of your cost. Occupancy should be 1%, all right? How much are you paying to rent an office? All right, not, not much. The Keller model allows for pastors. So offices here should be, how much an office here cost? A couple hundred dollars for the bigger ones, right, every month? So that's a very low percentage. If your gross commission income is $250,000, well, then your office rent needs to just be 1% of that, which is 2,500 for the year, 
right? So if you break it down, two hundred dollars a month times twelve months, twenty four hundred dollars. Boom, easy math. All right, education and coaching, two and a half percent. If you don't have a coach, I would encourage you to get one at any level. I can't talk about it enough. I never was a believer in coaching until I came to Keller Williams. I can tell you that I made more money in my first 10 months as an agent than in any 12 months I've made with my prior broker. And a large part of that was because when I joined, I got involved in a level up coaching program they were offering because I thought it would help Kellerize. And the truth is it did, but not in the ways I expected, right? Because what I found was accountability. I found a way to look at my numbers. He was one of the first people to sit down with me and go through an exercise like this where we backed it out and said, okay, how much you want to make? Well, I want to make X. And he said, okay, you need to make a plan and undertake these activities every day. And that's how I started learning the Keller models of 411 and 135. So go through the budget and do the exercise for yourself based on the 100,000. Refer back to this when you're building your plan and throughout your year, and you'll be able to tell. So if you're not great at accounting, that's okay. Here it is for you. Take the 250,000, multiply it times 14%, 9%, 1%, 2.5%. Run these numbers down there. Then understand as you go through the year, how close did you stay to it? Do you need to adjust, right? Maybe 0.6% maybe for auto isn't right. Maybe you spend more on your car. Maybe you got a Mercedes. Right, and, and this is based on 0.6%, probably more based on Dodge Dart, okay? So up a little for the auto expense, that's okay. Don't use this to beat yourself up. Use this to understand your numbers, understand your budget, and try to stick to it. So if you really like your nice car because, hey, it's cold, and my butt gets cold, and these seats are heated, then it's okay. Put yourself more on that and, and cut back a little bit somewhere else. Say, well, okay. I'm not going to buy a new smartphone this year or a new laptop this year because I'm spending a little more on my car and I got to stay in my budget model. The, the, the harder you work to own this, the, the better your money will be. You know, watch your pennies, your dollars will take care of themselves. Okay. All right. So, monthly PL statements. Here you go, guys. Take this home, scan it in. You're going to want a blank copy because this is where you find out how am I doing. Okay, this is where you sit down at the end of the month, at the very least every quarter, but should be at the end of every month. If not every week, I know a lot of top agents sit down with their teams and go over PLs on a weekly basis. But you need to know what's my residential income been, been? Have I got any commercial income? Do I have other real estate income? Am I getting paid for managing properties? Uh, maybe you want to break it down and you want to say my residential income is, is my actual sales. And all the referrals I send to St. Louis, I'm going to call that other real estate income, right? Maybe you want to be able to track how you're doing there, okay? So, cost of sales, once again, if you're an individual agent, that should just be your cap and your royalty, okay? If you have other cost of sales, let me know. Um, operating expenses, did I pay anybody? How much did I spend on lead gen? How much did I spend on my rent? Education, coaching, supplies. You roll all of that down. And you take it, and it's pretty simple math. We have our GCI, which we hope was 250 if we're looking at it at the end of the year, and we're doing a PL for the year, and it breaks down the same in the month. So I have 250 is my total income GCL, GCI. My total cost of sales, we're assuming we're running the model, so we'll keep it easy, was 75K. All right. All of my operating expenses, total operating expenses, it equaled 75K. Okay, so my total expenses was 75k plus the two plus the 75k. So I spent 150. All right, I subtract the 150 from the 250, and before I know it, there you go. I hit my number for the year. I made hundred thousand dollars business profit. Right now, below the line profit. This is not counting everything. Okay, you're going to have excess stuff that comes after. We call it below the line. So maybe you had income, interest income, vendor income, profit share income. And I talked to an agent yesterday who's going to make $17,000 this year in profit share. I have another one that we've added 10 people to their downline. If all 10 people turn into cappers, a capper was worth last year about $2,500 a pop in your first line. That person, if we get them all to be a capper, that person's going to make $25,000 profit share. They're going to wipe out their entire cap and royalty and profit share. So they're essentially, we're helping them wash out what they're spending. So that goes below the line, right? That's not 
stuff that comes from running your business. That's the, the gravy on top. Below the line expenses, employee profit share, pre-tax expenses, income tax. If you, some teams, the employee profit share is like, some teams when they start building a team will give their team members a share of the profits. So those are the kind of things you put below the line, okay? That's not an expense that comes out above the line. So make a copy of this, you'll utilize it to review your budget. All right, my business plan and current organization and future organization, we're not gonna spend time on these two models today because it's not necessarily applicable to everyone. If you're a newer agent and you're already thinking about how, how you're gonna add your third buyer's agent, I applaud your exuberance, but we probably need to drill down and don't go to what's next until we master the daily 10-4, right? So, all right, we have made it through the entire packet. You guys were, you guys were easy. I'm telling you, the group on Monday was a bunch of chatty captains, uh, or chatty, whatever you call guys that talk a lot of guys. I guess you can still call them Kathy. So, finish like we do every class, though. We're not done yet. Let's get a couple of ah ahas. Let's get some questions, some feedback. Uh, we can't, I'm not going to let anyone leave until we get a couple of ahas. You can go if you want to, but I'd like to get some ahas first, right? So, somebody give me an aha. Did you learn something? Did we cover something here today that you said, oh, wow, I need to know that. I need to know more about that. I need to dig in. Math. Math? Okay. You know what? And thank you for being honest. We don't all love math. What I hope we did, and, and what, what the packet is designed to do, and the way we did it today is, is to remove that that scary math. This is not we're not we're not doing um, algorithms and, and sending men into Mars, right? That's why we said it's okay to use averages. As I'm going to tell you right now, it's also okay to round up. Now, that's a team leader. If if Monica was in here, she'd tell you you need to know it right down to the point thirty three cents. I'm going to tell you right now that if you just work to the 100,000 goal and you end up making 94,000 and change or 104,000 and change, that's okay. I want you to be as exact as you want to be exact, but don't let the math stop you from this exercise. That's why we went through that worksheet step by step with easy numbers. You should be able to go back and reference that when you build your own and simply do those formulas. If you get hung up, call me, text me, email me. Well, <laughs> Don't email me. We saw that that probably won't get you very far. So text me um, or call me. That's a great one, though. What's another aha? Anybody online? Oh, I already started a Facebook exclusive group. There you go, Wendy. I love that, right? Wendy said, hey, that's a pretty good idea. I'm going to go create a Facebook group for my people. I see Jerry over there nodding a little bit. That's not a bad idea. So, so you know, that's another way. And, and those are touches. You're interacting. That's a high level. That's your referral network. They like you. Right? What, what are the stats, Jerry? 83% of agent of, of people surveyed would have used their realtor again if the realtor just ever called them again, just ever interacted with them again. They're like, oh, yeah, we loved Martin. but we never heard from him again, so we used somebody else the next time. And we also had the example of the woman who sent everyone in her database a recipe card. That didn't work either. They bought and sold with someone else. So it's about not only keeping them and staying in contact, but staying in a real estate related kind, they're gonna remember, right? So if I'm part of the Jerry Moore Group uh, closed client appreciation Facebook group, I'm not good at naming things, you might want something a little more, a little shorter, more creative than that. But if I'm a part of that, well, it's popping up on the scroll and Jerry is leveraging Facebook's algorithms to do a lot of the work for her. All she's gotta do is cook up a few things throughout the year of, ooh, hey, Vendor Partner X, and, and don't just think in terms of title companies and lenders. Who do you know that owns a hardware store? Who do you know that owns a cleaning company, a boat cleaning company, a boat service company, an oil change company? Who can you go and talk to and say, hey, look, I'd love to send a lot of business your way. I've got 300 people in my closed group that I interact with on a high level. And oh, by the way, if you'll provide each of them a 10% discount on their oil change, I'll tell them all to come do business with you. Now, that's not breaking an MREC law or anything, is it? Well, I'm not a broker, so you know what? Go for it. If Deb says not to do it, then listen to Deb, okay? And the point is, bye, Mariah. Um, I do feel, I feel horrible because I always want to call her Myra. I don't know why. I think it's because it's spelled that way. Uh, but the point is, that's a great idea for a way to interact with your people. So I love it. So one more question or aha, and then we can be gone. I think Ariel learned that her battery life on her phone is longer than she expected. I think that was her big aha. Uh -huh. 
I just love the conversations about, um, you know, hey, we bought a house in the last 10 years. It's a little more today. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. So what Jerry said was, don't forget the part about if they bought a house ten, in the last 10 years, it's worth more today. So guys, when you're building your plan, utilize your packet. Call me with questions. Elise, I assume we have this recorded and up on our YouTube channel so that people can go back and watch it. Excellent. I would encourage you to go check out the one from Monday. Same material. So mute me when I'm talking because you don't want to listen to me twice. But there were a lot of top agents on there that gave a lot of feedback. Um, we didn't have anybody in person. It was all Zoom. So they're all right there in the recording. That YouTube channel, Elise will share a link out real quick on the email. Um, it's Keller Williams Lake, the Ozarks Realty, because I didn't know how to build a YouTube channel and I ended up with a really long name. If you will please subscribe, once we get to 100 subscribers, we can get a short, easy name like Martin's YouTube. Or once again, I'm not very creative with that stuff, but we'll figure it out. Thank you, everybody, for being here. I appreciate it. You guys make your plans. Send them to me. Let me check them out if you want to. If you have any questions, call me. Have a wonderful day. Thanks, Elise. Oh, yes, you have a question, jump on it. Oh, wait, who? Oh, Jerry. Jerry had her hand over her mouth. I thought it was coming from me. I'm like, yes. Yes. Oh, all right. Yes, ma'am. Do you know how on command, your database, if you pull names off a tag, you want to create a CSV file? Solid export them? I want to export it, but it's only letting me do 50 at a time. It won't let me, like, I've got 1152 that I want to pull off that I want to send specific email to. But I, can, I don't know how to click all 1152. I think it'll only let you do 50 at a time. Let me pull it up here. Elise, I'm fixing to take control of this computer. Do you need me to do anything else? No? Okay. Bye, Elise.